unfamiliar path with a pulse of its own. Three, two, one. Final encounter cast. Interesting conflicts, not conflicts of interest. Typical corporate bullshit. With your hosts, Nate, Robbie, Chris, Nika, and Kelly. FinalEncounterCast.com Ready? Ready? Get set? What's up? Welcome to Final EncounterCast. Thanks for joining us today live here at twitch.tv slash Final EncounterCast. My name's Nate. Joining me, we've got Chris. How's it going? K R capital Y small <laughs> S Chris. Yeah. Oh, out of frame Chris. Can we get like a little uh, yeah? There accent, you go. Accent symbol above it now. <laughs> they don't have accents over Y's. I, can, you do. That's not technology that we have. Can we figure out how to get an umlaut above his name about above the Y, Chris? <laughs> What about a, what about a tilde after the X? There you go. I thought I killed Cum Loud in uh, Dalfox Tower. What? Uh, okay, that that's a far-reaching eleven. I didn't joke. even get that one. Wow, that one soared right over most people's heads. Anyway, thanks for joining us here at twitch.tv slash Final Encountercast, uh, the best gaming talk show that you might find today. Hopefully. <laughs> That's talking it up, man. Way to go, All right. Nate. All right, Yoshi. The Yay. best gaming if, talk show that you might find today. If yeah. You, if you don't qualifying that with, uh, yeah, well, whatever. And if you don't find it, fuck you. Yeah, you non-podcast finding assholes. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Hold them. There you go. Uh, thanks for joining us here at Twitch.tv slash Final Encountercast. Uh, obviously, we are down in Nika today. But we join. We thank you very much for it's that. It's the only way that I could be here. We had to get rid of Nika. That's right. That's it's what now, it takes. It's that's the real reason I've been gone. It's me now and Nika con- have been feud- feuding. It's contractually obligated. We yep. had to. We, the, host, co- the show can only contain one girl. There. <laughs> uh, I finally still here then. Yeah, I was like, with me sitting here, that joke goes to him. <laughs> Man. Like every good joke on the show, it will get misattributed to someone else. <laughs> oh, to be fair. He is wearing a sports jersey today. That's very bad. Hey, sports ball. Look at that. Yeah, how about that? Oh, look at that. It was disappointing as always. Yeah. Well. But, but he has a ponytail, so that 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 fucks it up again. <laughs> Sorry. You're still a girl. Anyway, thanks uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, by the way, I want to uh, mention that uh, we are available on iTunes and Google Play and Stitcher. And any other uh, podcast platforms that you could think of, Final Encountercast has its own feed, but it is also part of the LBR Podcast Network. You could search either one of those on any of those podcast networks. Make sure that you subscribe, and if you're a part of iTunes, leave us a little bit of review love. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be love. It can be whatever you actually think about the show. It's fine. We we encourage you to be honest with your feedback. If you don't like the show, hey, Telling us what we can do to get better is always uh, something that we appreciate. Uh, and uh, die doesn't count, though. If you do it in, if you do it in a way that makes you seem like a dick, maybe we might read it on the show and make fun of you. Because we, we do do that. Yeah, we we <laughs> do do. <Doo-doo. laughs> uh, anyway, look at what happens. The girl, the girl doesn't show up to the show today, and it just goes off the rails. Yeah, I don't like, like that. Earlier today, we had people just like guessing is Nika on maternity leave. Oh. <laughs> like, what? What? <laughs> that's the only reason girls can leave. That's, that's right. That's She's immediate. gonna love that. Yeah. Oh, she'll be thrilled. Oh uh-huh. yeah, yeah. I uh, like that everyone's like girls can wear jerseys too. Yeah. Well, yeah, misogyny. It's it's funny, guys. That's that's what we do. Prove that women are equal to men. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> but taking the Yu-Gi-Oh bridge drops. By the way, yeah, we it. we've we've uh, we got a uh, new batch of drops today. If you yeah. couldn't tell by uh, Limit Break Radio, you can tell because you can tell because Chris has a spring in his step. <laughs> Yeah, he's excited to use them. He's been using them all day. I haven't heard... I don't think I've heard an old drop. 
Yeah. <laughs> we have I think one. it's all been new drops. They're really far away. It's like <laughs> seven pages away. And this is why we need to get new drop software. We, we do. Yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, we are sponsored by Alamo City Comic Con, which, by the way, we will be out there. Well, I'll be out there. If you want to meet me, I'll be appearing out at Alamo City Comic Con October 28th through the 30th at the Henry V. Gonzalez Convention Center in San Antonio, Texas. But uh, it's not just going to be me. Some ex- uh, some other exciting guest announcements include Millie Bobby Brown, uh, who plays Eleven on Stranger Things, Ooh. which that is a fantastic show. If you Finally haven't finished it, oh, did you? Yeah. What did you? Did you like it? I did. I really liked it. the uh, The first night, I did episodes one through four, and then I kind of touch it for for a few days, and I got back into it. And yeah, nice. yeah, I was I was actually really really impressed with it yeah it, it's such a it's such a great series that calls back to uh you know a lot of just childhood in general <laughs> yeah childhood in general but also you know the 80s if you grew up in the 80s you'll definitely have an affinity for stranger things it it also throws if you're a big stephen king fan i think you'll get a lot out of stranger things so you got bullied a lot in high school or middle school eh. any school Fair. I got bullied a lot. Fair, uh, you know. Also, if uh, if you're a fan of D and D, I think D and D plays yep. a really big, really big role in this as well. So Millie Bobby Brown is going to be out there, uh, as well as uh, William Zabka, uh, also known as uh, Johnny of the Cobra Kai in Karate Kid. There's going to be a duo, <laughs> the real Karate Kid. There's going to be a duo photo op with him and Ralph Macchio. So, uh, but and again, and I mentioned this on LBR, dude. Ralph Macchio did a pretty okay job at the uh, at the <laughs> don't ro- sell him short now <laughs> at, the, at the roast of uh, of Rob Lowe I mean as well as Ralph Macchio can do I, I like that Ralph Macchio has just accepted his place in the world well it, yes when you're Ralph Macchio I don't think you have much choice uh, <laughs> but also Jason Font uh, the Red Ranger of Power Rangers Time Force is going to be out there and uh, if you don't care about the new Power Rangers Jason David Frank and Amy me, Joe Johnson will also be out there. Oh, the two best ones. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm excited to be able to meet or have the chance to meet Amy Joe Johnson. Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, tons of other really cool uh, celebrity guests are going to be out there, including, God, uh, you know, everyone important from Doctor Who. Jason Mewes. Uh, Jason, Nobody. Jason, Jason Mewes is going to be out there. Man. Uh, yeah, Purple Man. Uh, also, uh, uh, like most of the Daredevil cast is going to be out there as well. Is Lando nice. going to be there? Yeah, yeah. Lando's going to be out there as well. I want to drink a forty with uh, with Billy D. Williams. I really, really want to get some Colt forty five. And and just be able and I'm sure he's never heard that before. No, either. I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No although, ever said that. although I'm sure you know, like I don't know, like that's a pretty dated reference. I'm not, sh- yeah, you know, you should get your game right. of cards and like win his vehicle from him. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, a lot of really cool people going to be appearing out at Alamo City Comic Con, so make sure you join us October 28th through the 30th. It's going to be a party at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, sunny San Antonio, Texas. Sunny San Antonio, Texas. Yeah, I think it's weird that they're promising that the weather's going to be nice. <laughs> right? How can it's they... just going to be like storming all weekend yeah, long? That's gutsy on their call. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so something I really I wanted to touch on before we got into the news here today is, uh, you know, we've all been hard at work on a new project. We gave you guys a bit of a preview of it. The uh, uh, it, not the last episode, but the episode prior to that with our uh, esports gaming update. But, you know, this new show that we've been working on, uh, y- you know, it's really exciting to be able to do this and to to have the opportunity to be able to do that. But we want to remind you that even though we're given the opportunity to be able to develop new content with the possibility that it could succeed on a medium that's not necessarily podcasting, that this show, specifically Final Encountercast, and its weekly schedule is supported by you, the listeners. And that happens over at patreon.com slash limit break radio, where we are currently sitting, and I am so proud to say this, at 191 patrons. That is a high watermark for the number of people giving 
to Limit Break Radio. Almost 200. But, but we are just shy of the $2,000 goal to keep this show weekly. We are currently sitting at $1,907. So we're going to need uh, some of you in the audience to step up and get us back above $2,000 to be able to ensure this show stays weekly. And we want to keep it weekly. We love doing this show. Uh, but uh, we can only do it with your support. And uh, that happens over at patreon.com slash limit break radio. All right, let's check out what's going on with the news. I'm here <coughs> to do the news tonight. And that's the way the news goes. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you important news. Here's a story that's out of this world. <laughs> Alrighty, well, let's start off in the world of Pokemon Go, where we saw a large update this week, including the release of the Buddy System. Players will now be able to walk with a Pokemon and generate candies in that fashion. You know, uh, I, I have you guys been enjoying the update? I've seen a lot of actually like small quality of life changes that came along with the update, not just the Buddy System. But what do you guys think of the Buddy System so far? Well, uh, one thing to mention is that how far you have to walk for a piece of candy is dependent on what kind of egg the Pokemon Ooh, comes of out of. <laughs> yeah. So if it's a uh, if it's a two k egg, it's a kilometer. If it's a five k egg, I believe it's three kilometers. And if it's a ten k egg, it's five kilometers. So I think for things like starters, which you know, even even if you're hatching a lot of eggs, you not necessarily seeing a whole bunch of them and when you do you can only get like four candies out of it i think it's great um i know a lot of people who are looking for their gyaradoses yeah. super super excited about it but when it comes to something like dratinis <laughs> or snorlax well you know snorlax is something that doesn't evolve that's fine too because you only need or or that you or don't four, see level. or that you don't see in the wild very often yes. i mean things yes. that that you have restricted access to their candy but when you need a hundred, like, let's say, Dratini candies, like, do you have any idea how many kilometers that's going to be for a hundred Dratini candies? Yeah, a long a way. Lot. Yeah, it's a lot of work. But the thing is, is that, I mean, if you're doing that and catching on a regular basis, I think that it's, you know, it's just, it's all for the good. Um, it's just been nice to be able to complete a bunch of evolutions that I was really close on, where I was yeah. only, like, a few candies away. First day it came out, I was able to get my Wigglytuff, and now I got my Arcanine. Nice. So things, yeah, things like that have been nice. Just to like right, play out um, those ones where I'm stuck at like 48 out of 50. Apparently, people are claiming that the egg does not determine it because apparently starters take three kilometers per egg. Well, so. They do. That's true. Uh -huh. My Charmander's three k. Yeah, it's the eggs that do determine it, but then starters get thrown in the three kilometer per gotcha. per okay. candy. So they're they're because the one fuck exception. Because, well, yeah, because they're they're <laughs> because uh, fuck you guys. Yeah, well, they're highly popular. So I mean, of course, they're gonna be. Uh, throwing a little bit more work at you to be able to do that, but I mean, I've I've noticed a lot of uh, uh, like a lot of um, the, the 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 app does not freeze up. I I have to close the app, like force close the app, probably eighty percent less than I had to before the update, mm. and I really appreciate that. And I have to wonder if that has something to do with Pokemon Go Plus, which is also the other major addition that we've seen to uh, to Pokemon Go this week. With the, It's that, that sweet little uh, uh, like dongle. It's like a Bluetooth dongle mm -hmm. that you connect up to your phone and you can hit stops and catch Pokemon right from the bracelet. Has um, anybody used it? Because I heard that early reviews for it weren't all that great. Not uh, just like saying, hey, look at my dongle. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not wrong. No, uh, I I mean, I know that uh, I think it's only the first round of people who had like pre-ordered the item have gotten it. So, oh, okay. um, And I think you can reserve... Uh, you can reserve them over at GameStop, and I think Amazon has them uh, available to, to reserve, but they haven't gone out in a whole huge quantity. So it's been a limited quantity that's been able to get to people. Um, and no, I don't, I, I mean, I haven't used it, but... I have yet to see one be worn in out in public either. Yeah, no, I, I've not I, seen one I've yet. Not, I've not actually seen a, a physical one or been able to, to get a reaction, but, uh, you know, the... The, the reviews that I've seen have been pretty positive. If for no other reason, then it keeps your app active and counting steps, even if the app is... Even if your phone is in your pocket and the screen is oh, that's turned so off, so nice. Yeah. That might be worth getting then. Yeah, yeah. That's that's so which nice. is clutch. And, and the thing is, is, I mean, I don't know that I would ever... 
I would probably trust it to catch Pokemon. I, I, I at this point, I so don't even give a shit anymore because my North American Dex is done, and I had solid weeks of Kabuto farming, and I have more, I have more Kabutos and candy than I can ever even know what to that do with. Kabuti, so he's fine. That's right. Uh, and guess who my buddy is. Is it is it Kabuto? It's not Kabuto, <laughs> you dumb yeah, shit. What the fuck? Are Why you would talking you think about? it's Kabuto? You stupid asshole. It's of course Kabutops because I have five of them. Of course. Yes. My my apologies. It, you, you, <laughs> I accept your apology. Anyway, uh, so yeah, no, I I like the buddy system. Just getting additional candy is uh, is pretty good. Um, and I, I really am looking forward to pro- possibly getting a Pokemon Go Plus when they become more available. I think I think counting steps, even when the app isn't active, that's pretty clutch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So those of you waiting for the last Guardian to release, and oh, what a patient bunch you must be, will have to wait a little bit longer. Sony has announced yet another delay to the game, which was slated to release on October 25th. It will now release on December the 6th. With other fam- infamous titles like Duke Nukem Forever out of the way, The Last Guardian has become the standard for development hell jokes in recent years. Ten uh, but over ten years. I Guys, mean, th- there's another game that has that <laughs> distinguished say, is title. It, isn't Final Fantasy 15 giving them a run? Oh, for oh, to- oh yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Uh, if I- you- I, I don't know. I think if you're Square Enix right now and you're looking at Final Fantasy 15, you got to be just like wiping the sweat off your brow. You're okay now. Last Guardian's still coming out after your game. You're doing just fine. Actually, that, just, a week. that does take a little bit of heat off of Final Fantasy. But like, it really is confusing that, yeah, the, the release dates are getting pushed back, but they're getting pushed back these minuscule amount of time. And I, this it's one's like you're accomplishing a, that small of a time frame. A month and a half. What, a lot, are, what are you doing? I, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of, uh, of opinions because. We've thrown that question out before, especially surrounding FF15. Uh, I think we even have an email about that, possibly. We'll get to that a little bit later on in the show. Um, but if you want to uh, sound off and uh, let us know, 810-207-1764, or Final Encountercast on Skype, Kookie's hanging out and can take your call. Uh, all right, continue on. Yep. Uh, Mass Effect fans will have the opportunity to have their voice used in the upcoming Mass Effect Andromeda. BioWare announced the contest in which entrants will be able to do a line reading from one of two scripts and submit their voice. Bioware will choose two entries and fly them out to record them uh, in studio. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so Next, that's next a- time I'm down in the studio, Nate, this is what we're doing. Oh. I'm going to come down early. Oh, good. You're going to help me out with this? Uh, I Do I have a choice? Yeah, no. Okay, no. well, then I guess I know my answer. Don't worry. It's, he said next time he's in studio. That could be who knows <laughs> Next week, you dicks. <laughs> Come on, let's not make promises we don't intend to keep. That was a good one, uh, Chris. I, I enjoyed oh. that. Yeah. yeah, that was that was a nice one. I try. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, uh, Robbie, it has been a couple of weeks since we've uh, had you on the show, and uh, we did have that Mass Effect Andromeda trailer. What did you think the, of that? Well, it wasn't technically a trailer; it was gameplay footage. Oh, was it? This, this is what I think everyone has really really been waiting for um so it answers a few questions game looks magnificent okay and it, is there it, any it doubt like, it, looks, it looks like mass effect okay i mean right down to the way that that like as the character starts to, like run the way that they like that their shoulders kind of kind of hunch it looks like like it's the same for mass effect 3 let mass me just say let me just say okay like that is a fair compliment to give mass effect considering what is happening with metal gear just saying <laughs> yeah. just saying yeah. just saying because yeah. when when your metal gear trailer looks like a fucking resident evil game then that's a problem so i guess it looking like a mass effect game fair <laughs> yes yes um Sounds great. I mean, all the characters look magnificent. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of action gameplay going. Uh, basically, they're just kind of going down, uh, not a corridor, but they look like, it reminds me of the collector ship, and they're kind of like jumping with a little jetpack from like, you know, uh, area to area, scanning some stuff, and you see some aliens go over top of them, like, oh, don't worry, as long as you don't get too close, they don't get nasty, blah, 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 and stuff like that. And um, then when you get to the end, they do give you uh, a little cutscene. We get a little bit closer look at the characters, and you know there's some explosions starts to to get going a little bit more. So now that I've actually seen some of it, uh, I'm I'm okay placing my chips more in the I have a positive outlook corner. So I feel like at this point, the only other thing that I'm worried about or waiting for is the narrative strength of it. Because when it comes 
to Mass Effect, like all gameplay, all graphics aside, what really has to sell you, what really has to pull you in is the world, the lore, the characters. I mean, people fell in love with the characters from the first in a way that was unheard of. I mean, the, 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 the following that you have behind characters like Tali Zora or the hatred that people have for people like Ashley or Caden is just immense. So, do you know? It, it, I, I know till it actually comes out. Has there been any info about who's writing for Andromeda? Do we even know if it's the same writing writing staff? No. I would say most of Bioware left it by now, haven't they? I remember. Yeah, there was an exodus. I feel like at some point I remember them getting back the writer from Dragon Age Inquisition, but I don't know if that was for Mass Effect or not. Okay. Well, so uh, I'm not sure. I don't know, man. Uh, Dragon Age, does, that's not. That's also another uh, series that doesn't necessarily inspire confidence all the time. I like the Dragon Age series. I, like, I was actually a big fan of the second one, which a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You like shitty games. <laughs> Um, well, speaking of shitty games, and okay. thank you for mentioning Metal Gear Survive, Nate, because uh, Kojima was asked about it at Tokyo Game Show and had some interesting responses to his thoughts on Metal Gear Survive and whether or not he was part of that project. <laughs> he said, quote, that's nothing to do with me. The Metal Gear games are about political fiction and espionage. Where do zombies fit in with that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're zombie politicians. Uh, Wasn't there a girl who breathed through her skin in that series? Yes, there was. Yeah, I, I that's mean, about political f- fiction and espionage. <laughs> that's right. right. Yes. Uh, he also added on, if I had worked on that game, it would have had mechs in it. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, yeah. It might. Okay. Kojima. Uh, our, Kojima what are you doing? I don't think Kojima is giving this a fair a fair go. Okay. I want to see Kojima live stream it when it comes out. <laughs> That would be entertaining. Uh, I, I would feel like he was drunk. I, would, I would love to see him hate it. That would at, at the end of it, he does because because didn't he tweet that that gif of um snake putting a gun to his head or something? No, or something? I think that was a parody account. Yeah, it yeah, was a somebody parody did. Account. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see him parry that like in his stream where he's just like, you know what, puts a gun to his head as he turns the stream off. Part of me, oh part God. of me, part of me wonders if this was a statement that he actually. Made or if this was a parody account that that someone missed. Oh, that made the statement as well. Yeah, it could. I be. wonder that if he ha- was just drunk and they caught him in a moment where he wasn't ready to talk. Maybe I don't know. I mean, it's pretty interesting that uh, I, yeah, if I had been involved with the development, why that's you would have that's mentioned sh- it. Okay, all right, sure. You know what? He's weird enough that I believe that stuff he said. Probably, I, uh, maybe I don't know. You geeks are so gullible. <laughs> We are. You're not, yeah. wrong. You're not wrong. So after 23 years with Blizzard, Chris Metzen has decided to retire from his position as Aww. vice president of story and franchise development. Dubbed the story guy, Metzen has overseen the lore for both Diablo and Warcraft. He broke the news with a letter to fans everywhere and says he is retiring, not pursuing other creative interests. Mm-hmm. He wanted to make that very clear. He's retiring. He's not starting up his own company or going somewhere else. Interesting. He said he yeah. wants to go fat on his couch. Yep. Yep. When uh, when he I read that... It's, it's hard Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, when I first saw the announcement, like what I saw it was Chris Chris Metzen leaving Blizzard. I'm like, what the what? <laughs> yeah, what? Like he made Blizzard what it was. I I can't possibly see him getting a better deal than being at Blizzard. Right. Um. So then, yeah, when I read the letter and it's like, you know, he wants to spend more time with his family. He has a third kid on the way. Yep. I'm like, you know what? That's really cool. I can appreciate that. It's and, hard to begrudge him. Yeah. yeah. And, and with the year that Blizzard's had, I mean, Legion, great, uh, Overwatch, fantastic. He's, he's leaving on definitely a high note, that's for sure. Not a lot of people get to say that. Yeah, and, and yeah he, I mean, he's made his money, and as we've seen so often in the gaming industry, you either, you know, you get out when you can, or you end up being hated in a lot of cases. That's true, yeah. Like, Arnon saying that he does still plan to voice Thrall. Well, we'll see oh. how long uh, Thrall survives now that he has no say in it. Ah, <laughs> Fair enough. I just can't wait for a World of Warcraft story that doesn't involve corruption. Seriously, I no. have no idea what is happening right now. Seriously, though, I just like <laughs> props to Chris, Chris Metzen, who is just one of the really good guys, I think, in the industry. So, I, yeah, I, I always hear nothing but good things. So. Yep. So, a Reddit user named Tyler J. Wood has created a subreddit to take care of his plant. Every day, the Reddit Wait. votes on whether or not the plant should be watered. If the vote is yes, the plant gets a dose of water from the automated system. If not, then it goes thirsty. Oh. Thus far, the plant is hanging in there despite mixed voting from day to day. What? He has said that he will 
uh, refill the reservoir, but he, under no circumstances, will water the plant. If Reddit yeah. votes for it to die, it dies. Look, uh, first... <laughs> this means something. This is important. First of all, uh, <laughs> this is just two or three steps removed from taking a man and locking him in a <laughs> just room. Just two or three steps? Maybe just one. And putting a camera in there and allowing Twitch to decide whether he lives or dies. T Twitch plays humanity. That's right. Twitch it, Twitch plays God. <laughs> Honestly, it's no different from the kids back in like the late 90s who put up a, a, a PayPal, like a donation thing, was like, you know what? Uh, this rabbit here, in three days, we're going to show you how to skin it and make rabbit stew. Unless we hit our goal of like five thousand oh, dollars, don't yeah. kill the bunny. Yeah, and all I've those seen that you know animal loving PETA people out there begrudgingly donated <laughs> five thousand dollars to these high school jackasses so they wouldn't skin a rabbit. Jeez. Uh, this yeah. is uh. just like hilarious though that like this Reddit is still going with people trying to keep this plant alive or kill it. Wow. It's, uh, yeah, I, I really, I mean, we're getting down to, uh, to yeah, Twitch uh, Twitch fucks with people. <laughs> pretty like, much. That's, that's pretty much where we're at. Today in gaming news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Netflix has sent a letter to the FCC requesting that they consider making data caps illegal. As 4K video approaches, Netflix has become increasingly concerned that these data caps will impede their service to millions of customers. You don't say. Uh, yeah. yeah, and yeah. this is awesome on, I mean, this is on Netflix's part. This is purely driven in their own interests. Oh yeah. That yeah. said, their interests also happen to coincide with mine, so I'm in support of them. <laughs> Good uh, guy, Netflix. Yeah, kind of. Kind of how like the cup matches your shirt perfectly. Look at that. It's almost the exact same, same shade of blue. Hmm. <laughs> same, 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 shade. same shade of disappointment. <laughs> Good job, Lions. That was a great 16-15 loss today. <laughs> hey, this is esports, not frame. real sports. Way to go ahead and blow it in the fourth quarter. Nailed it. Uh, Nothing I, like I, that pick in the last thirty seconds of the game. Stafford's nailing it. I love. Are you upset? A little. I love the fact that that cups on this show get more screen time than interns, like on purpose. <laughs> Just saying, just saying. We have we have we have Papa Woody framed out of every fucking shot that we do on this show, but our drinking cups and our our flashlights and our water bottles are and very are very well prominently displayed. We have our priorities here at this show. Just so you know, we do indeed. So, what do you think uh, about Netflix doing this? Uh, I, I I mean, it's a. It, it's it's a play against what's going on in the market, which is good, uh, because ISPs have almost unlimited lobbying power, yeah. and when you have the ability to petition the government with money, you have a tendency to win, whatever whatever the fucking case may be. You have a tendency to to be able to influence people over to your way of thinking. Screw and, with the rules, I have money. And, and yeah, exactly. Kinda. And Netflix uh, it, you know, has money to be able to throw around. You know, we've seen other big companies get into this debate as well. And you have it's 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 funny because you you know you end up at this nexus point between uh, you know between uh, 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 movements where you have Google and the EFF coming together to work against you know uh, uh, places like Time Warner and Comcast. And, and I think that's fantastic. ISPs it, create the strangest of bedfellows. They really do. Like when they when the whole net neutrality thing was going on, people who you thought would never be on the same side of any argument forced to join forces. Yeah, it's it the weirdest thing. It really is. And I I I like it. Uh, I I I think that uh, Netflix and uh, and and companies like that that produce high levels of traffic, high bandwidth websites, they are really standing at the gate 
to and and they are really the big defenders for smaller sites like us because if if they get penalized for the amount of bandwidth that they consume it's only a matter of time before it comes down to sites like us because we serve a high you know like a a large amount of data off of our site because we refuse to allow youtube to be our only content carrier it is proved unreliable too many times whether it's youtube to directly censoring its content creators through taking money out of their pockets or whether it's been through consistently supporting the quote unquote copyright holders on you uh, you know uh, in in uh, intellectual property debates which a lot of times are completely fraudulent we've even gone through that on this fucking channel before sure have uh you know because we make those decisions and we decide to serve the content off of servers that we pay for and that we rent that we are we have more of a direct control over our content and how that's served out and data caps undermine that big time because then you've got a decision do i want to stream this netflix movie or do i want to download this week's lbr Ugh. how t how how awful is that for a small content creator because uh, uh, yeah. then you're looking you're looking at a uh, 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 you're looking at a scenario where content creators are looking at platforms to host their content because th they're afraid of uh, of you know counting towards that bandwidth cap yeah and i mean just recently uh which was it time war where they had the 300 gigabytes cap like that was nothing people were blitzing through that in no time yeah and now they've i mean thankfully now they've brought it up to a terabyte which is more reasonable well, but the fact that there's a cap at all is stupid chris robbie do you guys remember in college up at uh oh. up at cmu we had the penalty box you yeah. guys remember yeah. the penalty box what's the penalty box? the penalty the, bo penalty box. the penalty box that was it they they put a data cap on every single network port in the entire college campus and they would monitor exactly how much you would upload and download and i think you had two gigs up and four gigs down and if you hit that in a 30-day period they put you into what they weekly. call it weekly 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 yeah. okay and if you hit that they put you into the penalty box and the penalty box didn't re the penalty box reset at the end of the month that's what it was yeah. so if you got put into the penalty box first week you had four weeks of sitting in the fucking penalty box but the penalty box basically cut you off to the intranet uh -huh. it was only the the network the the um the college network you could go to you know everything dot seamish dot edu so you could oh still God. get your to your email, email homework you could still stuff. get yeah. to your homework but you could not access any other content outside of that and if you did it took like it literally it took like 90 seconds to three minutes for a web page rough to time to be I'm an gonna FF. You, uh, i'm gonna do you one better uh around the time that we were in college my mom had gotten new internet back at her house and so when i went home for the summer I sat down, this is when we were still playing uh, Final Fantasy XI, I would hit a macro, and 8 to 10 seconds later, it would go off. Yeah. Okay. Gosh. So I ended up looking up, like, why that? Why is this going so slow? I forget what the name of this internet was, but it was something I'd never heard of before. She had a 5 gigabyte monthly cap, oh. and then it would cap her down to, like, dial-up speeds. Oh. I'm like, this isn't working. I'm going to stay with Grandma for the summer. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's, Mom, this isn't working out for me. It was... <laughs> Like honest, so one it, we had found ways to weasel around the penalty box. Like one of the ways, f f the way that I had figured out was I had said, "Look, I run a podcast. It's a high media website, and I'm I'm doing you know three hour long uploads once a week, and that's going to contribute to my overall cap. I need you, you know, you guys need to consider me for an exception. I'm I'm." making something with I'm the important. skills i'm making something with the <laughs> skills that you're that i'm supposedly paying for do you know who i am it, it was a little bit like that yeah yeah ask was, jeeves me it? bitch i was i, <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> yeah this is a good throwback oh my god good callback uh but yeah no it, it was it was a little bit like that and and so i think eventually they gave me 
kind of special treatment. But before that, we had uh, all of the four guys in my dorm room had figured out how to switch MAC addresses, <laughs> had just do a soft like a soft hack on your MAC address, and uh, we would do that and just go download crazy because we knew, look, this isn't going to last forever. Just t- you know, <laughs> do do make the most of it while you can. They eventually caught on to uh, on to us, and they they took the three guys off the network, didn't take me off the network, and fined all three of them hundred dollars. <gasps> what? And I never got fined. Why not? I don't know. I don't know why they never caught me. <laughs> no idea. I have no explanation for that whatsoever. But yeah, that that actually happened, and I felt really bad. I ended. I think I ended up giving two of the guys who I got along with like fifty bucks, and uh, because I felt bad for it, uh-huh. but. The other t- the other two guys that were total assholes was like, nah, fuck you. I'm not giving you any money. You pay for that. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Ubisoft has finally confirmed one of their worst kept secrets as they unveiled Assassin's Creed, the Ezio collection. Uh, the new trailer showed Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, and Revelations all running at 1080p and will be releasing on November 18th for PS4 and Xbox One. I mean that's kind of cool. I only I ever had the chance. I only ever had the chance to play Assassin's Creed one. So the fact that it's the uh, Ezio collection, yeah. which is the good ones. E- yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah. And I and I heard that you know two improved on one, and I liked one. I I mean I played one all the way to the end, and that was like three or four years ago it was like way after yeah oh when, oh okay. yeah it was not that long ago and uh i i rather liked it and so i think that i may actually end up get, yeah. picking that up the three that are in this collection were all pretty decent like there's like it's a good collection yeah so yeah and they, it's nice to see them in 1080p i'm enjoying they're them. regarded well yeah and i'm enjoying seeing some of these games uh, get brought up into 1080p i was just saying i saw i did bioshock one and two are now remastered yeah. and they look really good yeah but i heard they were really bad ports yeah why bioshock i heard they were I, that, that that's what i've seen early reviews of the mass effect collection port not doing well Mass uh, Effect. J- janky, or did I say Mass Effect? Sorry. You did. Bioshock. <laughs> um, Bioshock not doing well. Uh, talking about janky controls. Um, I mean, just the, the, games the usual all- kind of stuff that you get from bad ports. I mean, the games were already on Steam. Uh, th- that's why. That's why when I read it, I'm like, what? Uh, what, what? I'm like, come no, on. How can they're you? They're fine. They're standard shooter controls. Huh? I'm gonna know. go with the guy who played it. Yeah, then they're fine. Oh, so, wait. So, so you've actually gotten the recent collection then? Yeah, well, you already you get the if you I owned a Bioshock one, two, and Infinite, so I got the remastered one and two for free, yeah, on Steam. That's a thing. Because mm-hmm. I I have one and I have one, two, and 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 Infinite. Check so your I, Steam, see if well, you got it. You should. There you go. I'm going. And they're really good. Yeah. Checking. Uh, recent changes to the way Steam user reviews have created some or uh, to the way Steam user reviews are handled have created some concern as now only players who purchase the game through Steam will have their reviews factored into the game's score. This cuts out a lot of people who receive keys through Humble Bundles or from Kickstart backing. However, the goal is to eliminate companies from handing out keys in exchange for positive reviews, a practice which has become fairly common up until now. This is not the worst thing that I've ever heard of. No, that, I like That's kind of what everyone's reaction to is. like It's not great, but like no one's real mad about it. No, it's just, I, I mean, that, it actually, that makes sense. There has been really shady shit that goes on especially surrounding uh green light and early access yes um it, you know that's people been, just getting their score or pumping up yeah. the game score for free copies to make yes, people want it exactly yep. and and Absolutely. i mean steam's got to do something and they've been kind of complicit doing nothing yeah to be able to curate any of the shit games that end up popping up on there and it's good that i i think that this is all for for in the end anyone who's even skeptical of this is going to go yeah this is probably something that that they they could have even probably done it sooner than they did. There's a little element of breaking an, uh, some eggs to make an omelet for this, but it's f- overall for the best. I think the only people who are really going to complain about this or really feel like this is a huge deal are the people who were getting free shit for their reviews in the first place. I agree. And, I mean, you know, if I don't feel bad for you if that's the case. Sorry. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, game developer Digital Homicide has been no stranger to oh, the news God. here at Final Encounter Cast. <laughs> as, we last, as we last reported, they were suing game critic Jim Sterling for slander and libel after he tore into one of their games. 
Taking it a step up, they have now put forth litigation against 100 Steam users, claiming they, uh, them to be a hate group. Steam has taken a stand, removing all of Digital Homicide's games from the Steam store and refusing to conduct business with them again. <laughs> Steam! You got served! Steam making some really smart decisions this yes. week. Man. Does anybody else just view Digital Homicide as like this little group of wannabe evil villains? Like, eh, what are we going to do this week, guys? Well, we went after Jim Sterling last time. How about we take on the Steam users now? <laughs> yeah, I like when, it. When you're down to suing users and consumers, it's never a good sign. That's a bad place to be. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're in a bad, bad spot at that point. I just love this Steam finally. I said, you know what? Go away. Yeah. We're, do we're done. Get, I, I, get out of here. I, I, well, Steam f needed to step in and take a stand. I mean... I'm going to enjoy the lawsuit when they start suing Steam for... <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's the next inevitable thing yep. because a Digital Homicide is so happy is that they're going to sue... First, they're going to sue us, and then they're going to sue Valve. <laughs> You're because some kind of moron, you know that? Because we're talking about them. <sighs> so utterly ridiculous. It is. It's stupid, and these guys are very, very dumb people. So. Uh, so an expanded demo for Resident Evil 7 is now available to all PlayStation 4 users. It expands off the original demo we saw at E3 and other events over the summer and is no longer restricted to only people with PlayStation Plus. So if you guys want to check it out, it's free to check out. It's a good demo, too. Yeah, I got to really say, is. it's a very fascinating demo. Very much. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have compared it to PT, which is a fair, uh, you know, a fair comparison for a game that never actually released. It gets compared to a lot. It does. <laughs> well, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, I think it stylistically made some choices that set it apart from a lot of other horror games. Mm -hmm. And since it didn't come out, a lot of people feel, I think, free to just sort of swipe it. It's, Pretty it's kind of like when you want to describe a new show or movie with a sci-fi element to it, you say it's Firefly-esque. That's that. not a bad comparison, yeah. No, fuck you. That's always a bad <laughs> comparison. <laughs> Whenever I come Jeez. with him with a new show, he's like, I swear if you say it's like Firefly, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> Well, wow. that's what Crit everyone always says, and guess what? It's never like Firefly. So just <laughs> stop using that comparison. <laughs> just like whenever anyone says, "Oh, uh, this game's like Final Fantasy Tactics," you should play it. No, it's not like Final Fantasy Tactics. You fucking moron. Chris with the butt hurt. And that butt hurt. It's just truth. <laughs> truth. I hear butt hurt. I hear butt hurt too. There's definite salt there. Yeah, yeah. Butt hurt. Butt hurt is present. Are you doing okay? You want to talk about it? No, I want to find a drop to express my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> You want us to give you a second? I like the uh, the day where Chris can only express himself through drops now. <laughs> he has to go around in the real world with a little sound po uh, pad in his, por in his pocket. just like, yes, this is how I feel. The the <laughs> Oh, my God. The day he gets throat cancer and he has to get his vocal cords removed, you're going to feel like an asshole for that joke. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm going to... Uh, we have any more news? Wait, I'm gonna wait, wait. <laughs> Chris is like, I don't like all this making fun of me. Let's continue. I'm gonna the tell show. them it's very ironic, just like Firefly. <laughs> that was. was your fucking. That was the drop you went with. That was after all of that build up and setup. That was the one you picked. Uh, you're terrible at this. Back over to the desk I of games being turned person. into movies. Capcom has officially confirmed a Monster Hunter, Hunter movie is in the works. God, Details remain scant, but the film is currently in pre-production. Is this it, even a, a okay. game series that would Wait. make for a good movie? Hold on, though. Hold on, though. It's live action, right? Uh, to my knowledge, yeah. Okay, I don't even care if it's true to the game. I just want to see a bunch of people running around fighting giant monsters. That could be cool. Okay, yes, maybe, maybe. Yeah. But... Is it a game? I, I mean, honestly, like, you know that they're probably going to try to take s at least some cues from If they put the, the game. cats in it, fuck them. <laughs> I just, what is that, What is going on in Monster Hunter that you say, yeah, we can build a movie out of this? That's exactly what I was saying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Let's what the, the fuck? monsters, yo. Okay, so if they turn it into the most mindless, retarded, like, you know that Russian superhero flick? Oh, that looks so great. That has, like, Bear Guy and, like... The it, machine gun? Yeah. Commander like, Bear. What the fuck? If, they, if it's just completely mindless from front to back, like... Like, the guy who made Kung Fury had produced this movie. I could probably be into that. Anything else, though, I don't know. Basically, there needs to be no story whatsoever. Yeah. It's just people fighting monsters. Kinda, I, want, yeah. I want, like, the Pacific Rim of a Monster Hunter movie. That's what I'd like. 
I don't. I'm. I don't want any. I want. I'll, let's go. No dialogue. Let's just. <laughs> No, like, they don't even, no one needs to say anything. It's just that much action. That's artsy. I like it. There's, there's, yeah, like, it's a stylistic choice, right? Yeah, like, yeah. it's not, it's not like, like, the movie slows down and allows you, like, uh, uh, like, you even catch the fact that there's a stylistic choice, right? The movie opens with an explosion and it closes with a bigger explosion okay it's the only thing that happens is actually dialogue would sound out of place in the movie because too many things are happening at once it's the oh only God. way that only way that movie's good explosion. better yet there's dialogue but the explosions are so loud you can't hear it <laughs> nate they need to sign you on to this movie i am i'm into this idea I, look, i'm ready i i i am just made of ideas okay if hollywood comes knocking i can just i can make you infinite money oh. it sounds really great nathan bay <laughs> <laughs> what uh, woof okay. michael bay nathan bay uh, okay. yeah but it wasn't funny yeah but see again I, michael bay puts dialogue in his movies where there really shouldn't he be. are you gonna have lots of explosions yeah but not it, look he needs t if he took out all of the dialogue and replaced it with people breathing and talking explosions then maybe they would start to get towards good movies but until then i just don't see the point what's your stance on lens flare are you gonna have a lot of that uh, look I <laughs> you got filter power use it <laughs> You need to have lens flares on top of lens flares. Explosions oh. need to be causing lens flares. The, there needs to be so many explosions that the sun pales in comparison to the brightness of the explosions, and those explosions cause lens flares. It's gonna be a great movie. It's a fucking perfect movie. It's gonna honestly, honest to God, if people are thinking about voting for Donald Trump, then this movie would make a million dollars. One million. Stoner's that's movie it. Movie of choice. That's it. One million. That's it. Just the bender even. That's, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. yeah right. Even one I exactly. Like uh, and maybe my favorite news I have ever reported on: a booth at the Tokyo Game Show had to impose tighter restrictions on its <laughs> visitors. The booth, which had a mannequin which could interface with a VR headset to create a physical person, was subject to constant boob groping by patrons. Managers of the event had to request M2 Corporation not to allow visitors to feel up their mannequins anymore. So wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah, this on. this happened at Tokyo Game Show, right? That's correct. Okay, so this is the same country where you can buy schoolgirls' panties out of vending machines. I don't think that's still a thing, but it was, yes. Okay. Uh, they still have cafes with mirrors on the on the floor. Yep, they do. Where have you that. can yeah, and the, the waitresses don't wear panties. Stop. Mm. I, I mean Stop. <laughs> You can only get so hard. Stop. No. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Threw up in my mouth a little bit. So, um, yeah. This, it, 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 look. It, where do they why draw are the you line? Like, it's such a weird line to draw. Why would the event organizers be even remotely surprised that this is what happened? Yeah, basically, it was this mannequin that they were projecting an anime girl on top of, and people kept groping her boobs and feeling her up. And apparently people were getting really out oh, there. Of the game, though? Someone actually, I think it was more of a demonstration of the technology of being able to place a, uh, a VR representation over a physical object. <laughs> then why would you do it with an anime girl? Because Let's it's Japan. want people to grope it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. There are entire games where that's the premise exactly. of the fucking game. Yeah. Where uh, you take the stylus and, hey, I can make her boobs jiggle. Ha <laughs> ha. It's like for once in this entire industry's history, someone actually finally stopped and was like, oh, should we have done that? <laughs> Apparently a guy... We need, to sh we need to shut this down now. Apparently yeah. a guy was quoted saying, this is so exciting. Soon I'll be able to fall in love with a virtual girl. And it's just like, oh my god. Stop. It's like Thank trying to... Please. It's like trying to defend Balmung. It's just hard sometimes. Oh, Balmung I don't is hard like that all joke. the time. I don't like that joke. <laughs> phrasing, joke. phrasing, Stop. phrasing, phrasing, phrasing. God damn it! Do you want don't want to. No, I want to think about Balmung being hard collectively. Jeez, gross. Phrasing. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Page one. Wow. <laughs> so far away. We d this highlights more reason than ever we need to get new drop software. This is terrible. Going back mm. to page 38. You... 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> you need to organize these things better. So also out at the Tokyo Game Show, we got a look at the official trailer for the HD remaster of Final Fantasy XII, and I believe we're going to check that out now. Sure. Let's Hopefully we don't get our video flagged. There we go. Uh, we probably will. That happens. That seems to happen a lot. It's Square Enix, no. I don't know, Square Enix can be cool about it. In the faraway realm of Ivalice. As long as not the 14 division of Square Enix. <laughs> we might be whitelisted, although maybe not Final Encounter Cast. I don't know. I gotta say, I'm really looking forward to this. It looks I, really nice. I really, I, I feel like I just didn't give this game a proper shot when I played it the first time. I also had a big track of time where I stopped playing it and then picked it back up and, and finished it. And I really do. I'm, I'm excited to give it a second shot. Yeah. Well, you know what I actually realized was it for me? Like, like, I realized, I think, what immediately set me on the defensive against this game is this was the first Final Fantasy game that didn't have turn-based combat. Sure, yeah. Well, and and I or, think... Or random encounters for that, man. That, too. That, too. Um, and, what about you Final know, Fantasy XI, bro? I think... Well, it, it, th that's the thing, though, is that when you play twelve, you do catch hints of eleven. And you do sort of see the underpinnings at work for what they, you know, it, it, it's it's widely known that the gambit system is one of the things that is the underpinnings for 14. So you do, I think you see a lot of those, you know, kind of concepts being worked out in 12. Yeah. And they hold together very well. I remember seeing 12 we played and just thinking like, God, I wish I could do some of these macro setups in 11. And and I think you're right, Robbie. I think you actually touched on something there that at the time when 12 had come out, I think all I wanted was the game to be another like 10. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I, yeah. I wanted the turn-based, I wanted all of that stuff back. Was the first time that the story, like, there wasn't a, like, like main anta or protagonist, you know, yeah. like Cloud, Squall, Zidane, and, and Renoa. Like, like sure. everyone was sort of, like, like in it, you know? So I feel like they tried, or, or well, they obviously succeeded, but they, they changed too much about their formula at once, mm. and at least for me, and it seems for you as well, that was weird well definitely coming out of a, like I, i've been playing a lot of 11 i was looking forward to when 12 came out for a okay now i just get to go back to what i'm used to with final fantasy 11 is my big yeah, step yeah, outside okay. the box yes I can now see i want to go back to my comfort zone a little sure. bit with 12 and That's I'm like, whoa this is not at all to chris's criticism would be yeah because with something like 11 which was the first online game you were willing to give it a little bit of wiggle room because it was yep. something completely different yeah, I, and 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 the thing is, is I'd like to. I, I'm excited to go back to it to play it again. Now, in in retrospect, given that I've been able to find so much enjoyment in both 11 and 14, and that you know, like if it was 13 being remastered, I could give a shit. But 12, <laughs> 12 it, it existed in this really interesting, uh, this really interesting, you know, uh, evolution time for the series, where it, it really was their first time getting away from a very standard tried true formula and i don't know like it, it part of me feels like like you know getting rid of that definitely lost something from the series but the adventures the adventurous spirit to say you know we're gonna break with convention and try something new i think that is essential to final fantasy because yeah. Something does change about the game every mm -hmm. single time. And I definitely think that now that we're so far removed from the days of 7 through 10, I think we'll approach 12 more open -minded. I think you're right. I think That's you're absolutely actually, right. Yes, a very interesting comment because I've noticed going back and playing even the ones that, that I love, you know, Final Fantasy IX, Final Fantasy VII, I'm realizing things or remembering things about the game or, or just seeing stuff that at the age that I played it, Never would have came across to me. You wouldn't be able to. You didn't have the maturity to appreciate. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Or, or, or 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 just something. So even even I, I'm I'm perfectly aware that going back and playing this game, 
I could love it, right? But now there could also be some other underlying factor that jumps out at me even more that I would have completely missed before. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing it, too. It's also the Zodiac version, the, the, yes. which, which is, from what I understand, the superior, the definitive mm -hmm. superior version. And I'm also excited to play that yeah. version because we never, I mean, I never really got the chance to play it, uh, you know. when our, uh, our friend Norris had mentioned to us once, which, which I didn't know this. Uh, Nate, you didn't. We'll see if, if Chris or, or, or Joe, I think you were, you left by this point. But apparently in that game, in the original one that we got, the weapons that each character starts with, that's their worst weapon. So if you keep both here using guns throughout the entire game, that's like the nerfed version of him. Isn't that weird? Did anybody know that? I definitely didn't know that. It's what? because they have the uh, special animation or whatever, and they attack like .1 second slower than if they have a normal weapon. Interesting. Yeah, he mentioned that, and it was almost one of those things where I wanted to call him. I'd be like, that's not true, but yeah, I, then I was I'd be like, prove it. But I, I wasn't I don't sure. Know. I'm like, maybe. I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. And again, it's been so long since I've even... You know, tried to investigate something like that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't. Again, I'm just I'm excited to be able to go back and play it. But again, I almost sort of you know I, I, we see yet another re-release from Square Enix. Yep. Um, and, what a shock! And as you can see, they can clearly make good games. Well, I I just can't help but notice that I yeah. Oh, and uh, I know this has been really weighing on your mind a lot, Nate. But I went ahead and finished Bravely Second. Go ahead and pass on it. Don't do it. It's oh, so, really? I can, so just uh, uh, just go ahead and delete it off my uh, SD card. Go ahead. You're not like it was okay, but you're not gonna like it. I promise. Aww. You're not gonna enjoy it. <laughs> That's too bad. Yeah, I know. Prove him wrong, Nate. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and finish it up. Let me know what you think. Yeah, I, that's the thing is that I don't think I'm actually like I'm I'm jonesing for that style. Uh, you know, like a after a while, I really start to itch for a classic Final Fantasy game, and and Bravely Default scratched that itch. But I don't know. I haven't had that itch in a while. Like I, 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 I it's not that I've moved on by any it's means. That you're it's playing just Pokemon. Yeah, I'm playing Pokemon. I mean, I haven't. To be fair, I haven't had the itch. It's funny. I, I say I haven't had the itch, and then my ass immediately starts itching. <laughs> what is what's with that? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I haven't had the itch to play Metal Gear either in a while. So you're waiting for survive. Yeah. We yeah, that's know what it, it is. We you all know gotta it. survive. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what that is. It may be uh, me trying to branch out a little bit. I had that Dark Souls phase too. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it's now the Dark Souls phase. <laughs> Dark Souls. <laughs> phase. I had that Dark Souls phase where I had the hair that slicked over to one one uh, one eye, and I used to paint my one one hand only one hand. I would paint the black uh, the uh, the fingernails black. For some reason. Yeah, but you don't do the thumbs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, I got you. Yep. All right, so Poland is going to be putting an image of Geralt on a limited run of their postage stamps this year. The lead character of the Witcher series will be receiving the rare honor, as it's very seldom that a nation recognizes the artistic contributions of a game developer. Mm. Well, it's it makes sense, because when you know, you're know you Poland, your only export is video games, then... <laughs> oh, come on! They, don't come they have on! That's not fair! They are well known for their submarines and their screen doors that they put in the submarines. Come on. Poland makes really good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Losing it over there. <laughs> what? I, I, they I, make I, they make sausage and kielbasa. And Polacks? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is their chief export? I have no idea. I'm I'm going with the Witcher. Uh, Finding out. Maybe. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> Great. Yay. Can, uh, can, can you tell us it's GDP too while you're at it? <laughs> is that possible? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it means gross domestic product, you uneducated <laughs> dickhead. Oh, my God. You guys really don't know Europe. You're correct, Narnan. We do not know Europe very well. Nope. Vehicle parts. Interesting. Actually, that makes sense. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. All right. So in an interesting interview with Polygon, Riot Games owners Mark Merrill and Brandon Beck confirmed that e the eSports side of League of Legends is still running in the red. Despite being one of the most popularly viewed eSports in the world, the company is still investing millions of dollars into events for it without seeing a profit in turn. The creator said, quote, Our goal with eSports has always been to make a great player experience first. It is important to note, however, that unlike many eSports, Riot runs its events almost entirely in-house. 
And we're going to talk more about this, but for more information on the news and other stories, visit our blog at FinalEncounterCast.com. But I thought that was a really interesting read, that one of the largest esports out there operates in the red and pretty much knowingly so yeah I, i'm i don't think that i'm actually that surprised especially no. coming out of riot specifically because esports is in the position where it needs to be running as much promotion as it possibly can if it's trying to elevate itself to an entertainment product on the level of being you know being covered by espn or i mean because you know you you hear People from the ESL. You hear people from, uh, you know, from from the esports scene, and their ambition is to be right up there in prime time, along with baseball, basketball, sure. football, yeah. and get the prime time coverage that they feel it deserves. Now, whether or not you agree or disagree with that, if that is the goal, then, yeah, you have to run your company in the red. You've got to throw every cent that you have at promotion and getting more eyes on it and cracking those deals. Sure. You know, that's it's going to be hugely important, and it's probably going to be that way until... You get this, uh, you know, this this thing established as a foothold in American culture. Like, there's not even a market for this. You're talking about getting, you're penetrating the culture of the American psyche. Esports has taken off in the rest, and not necessarily everywhere, but in pockets, it's taken off in the rest of the world. Sure. Specifically in Korea and, and in a lot of Asian countries. Well, and that's the weird thing about Riot choosing to run all their major events in-house. Almost every other game, the company doesn't run everything. They license it out to a league or something. Right, you that get, runs that's it. where you get the ESL. Now, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Riot has the advantage in that they always get to control how their product is presented. Right. But they have to spend so much money running that, whereas normally whoever they license it out to would foot the bill for that. And it's an interesting decision that Riot is deciding to do that all in-house because, you know, yeah, while you do get to carefully control the image of your product and of the scene that you're trying to cultivate around it, I think it it also creates a really strange bedfellow or not, it, it, it does create really strange bedfellows because now you've got riot cre trying to create a proprietary media product they're trying to create uh you know ancillary rules around a, a, a league that they want control of and they're still developing a game and they're still trying to create a fun product at the end of the day for people to load up on their own computers and have fun with on their own time, not just on the professional level. So they're balancing a whole lot of factors there besides concentrating on creating the most professional product that that they possibly can. So what's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know when you see, you know, officially league presented uh, stuff sure. versus ESL stuff, who has the better presentation or are they pretty damn close? close they're similar what's always nice about like league presentations is they're riot as a company they're fun right they, they kind of remind me of like blizzard they're willing to just be silly and do like weird stuff so a lot of their events like whenever something is t happening in the game it'll have a tie-in with its professional presentation they did a, they introduced a new mode years ago called ultra rapid fire which basically like all your cooldowns are set down to minimum mana is stripped out of the game you can just spam moves for days and so when that happened as an april fool's joke they did a special invitational between two of their biggest pro teams where they played each other in a game of ultra rapid fire which they were claiming was going to be what season six was and it was just, it was absolutely <laughs> ridiculous but it was a lot of fun to watch and it's nice to see the company be so involved with that whereas with things like esl there's more of a divide there i guess well and they're they're trying to create i mean their their priority at the esl is to not just create a very strict league environment sure. that's regulated because you need external regulation that's where riot steps in that's where you know esl officials step in stuff like that you also uh, you know they're also uh concentrating on making the most professional product that they possibly can right like if you think about it if you've got a company that is concentrating only on you know the tv production aspect of presenting this game then you don't you know like you don't have to ever worry about the way that the game balances 
ever because that's not that's not your business. You're right. you're a media company. Right, right. It, and league is trying to balance both of those. So yeah. uh, the, uh, and uh, that's what made me ask like do you ever see a quality difference uh between the two presentations? Like it, I, I I get what you're asking. Like you see like sometimes weird things will happen like we already know what patch the worlds are going to be played on in October. Like the, they said that this recent patch that just happened will be what the worlds patch is going to be. So right. even as the game continues to advance uh, in the time between now and worlds, when those tournaments happen, it will be how the game is currently. I, I, I'm just talking like straight up cameras, microphones, sure. production quality and and you know the presentational quality. I would you would think in the abstract. Right. In the abstract abstract that the ESL would actually have the leg up because they don't have additional concerns like developing the game, balancing the game, and having all of the actual game parts that Riot has to be concerned with. I, well, and you know, that's probably one of the reasons that Riot is running in the red, because they have to try all that much harder. People in the chat have been saying things like uh, how, you know, CSGO, they, they, you know, they're making profits, or Dota's making profits. So I think it just happens to be a coincidence that the biggest one is operating in the red. But like you said earlier, Nate, it all has to come down to legitimacy. They are trying to cement themselves as a legitimate you know, source of, of sports and entertainment. And in a world that is resistant against that, you're going to have to try harder because they're not going to do it for you. Well, That's right. Yeah. An, an important point to note, too, is Riot's not running in the red. The eSports segment right. is Riot yes. is very much yeah. running in the black. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is... that is. And uh, that's actually kind of what I thought was interesting about this. Even running in the red on its eSports side is the publicity and the eyes that they draw into League of Legends worth that. I think it is because you've got people who end up picking up the game. They end up buying, you know, some skins or, yep. you know, unlocking some, uh, some additional additional heroes whatever sure. you know like that it, it, because it, it, yes it acts as a promotional end for right. your game and you end up getting more end users per promotion but at the same time you see the opposite happen a lot with starcraft there's lots of people who watch professional starcraft with no intent to play it That's and right. that might just be the unbelievable like barrier of difficulty that starcraft and rts games yeah. bring with them mobas are more accessible inherently I don't know, but you see, like, lots of people no, watch I th Starcraft. I think, that's, I think that's exactly what it is. I mean, think about it. When you're playing League of Legends, how many buttons do you have to press? Four? Four? Uh, six. You, okay. <laughs> Four to six, let's say. Yeah. Whether, you, whether you're casual or going hardcore. Yeah. Okay? Um, do, is there, like, a like a global cooldown in, in League of Legends? No. Okay. Well, I mean, you have to wait for your spell to cast before you right. can do anything. Right, okay. Yeah. So... What would you say is the actions per minute for League of Legends? Uh, it's fairly high, but all on the mouse side of things. Mm -hmm. Not but so much on the keyboard. Definitely not like, you know, not, not It's all movement based. It's nothing like yeah, StarCraft. Like, nothing even close. When I, that day that you told me that, and, and I actually, like, that connection was finally made in my head. Yeah. I suddenly realized why I was so shitty at StarCraft playing on my demo disc it's, way back in, like, 99. They had a, they used to do a series, they don't do it anymore, where they would basically. They, it was a split screen series where you could see what was happening on the on this and the game and then they on his hand as well yeah and so what's happening while he's playing he's in a huge battle and his right hand is macroing around his units and his left hand is building more units back at home and hot keying oh. them out to the field yeah that's like, ridiculous it's and they're in like you can't even keep track of his fingers they're just a blur oh as it's, it's oh, unbelievable yeah. it's it's like watching uh, a, a skilled pianist play a very complicated yes. piece and you think no nah, i couldn't do it there's no Never. way there's no. no way and and you're right i think that that does create a, a bit of a barrier to entry but i think you know like again riot running its own it, it, it basically its own tv uh, not tv but its own video presentation you know uh, again it, it it's got it's promoting two things. It's promoting both the the idea of esports and the league that they're trying to form around their game, but it is also promoting their game. So sure. I I would think that division I would all I would run in the red as long as the company overall yes. was in the black. Yeah, because you can you can absorb the losses from that department with the gains that you get from either selling. You know, selling skins yeah. or or whatever it is, and, and you, it's you, all investment in the future of the uh, 
of the sport of the at this and, point. and the yeah. yeah and your well, exactly. your end product too. There's no marketing division in the world that runs in the black. Right. Every one of them runs in the red. That's just how it is. If they look at it as their marketing division, then great. Right. Like that you're doing exactly they, what you want to do. If they were in a position where they didn't need to do marketing, which by the way, no sports league in the world is in that position. But if they were in a, in the in the position where they had to do less or they could bargain the price down that they were having to pay for their promotion mm-hmm. then you know i think that you would you know like you would start to see uh you know you would start to see uh the the division run closer to in the black or if 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 not completely in the red but you know you know what i mean yeah. like if you take that element out of there money is being generated no matter what yep. like that is definitely happening but i think that in order to be able to elevate the league to where it needs to be in the in the cultural consciousness that you've got to you have to run in the red you have to spend as much as you possibly can to tell people look we're here and this is awesome and the, yeah this is what's going on and going back to your point earlier about does their production quality suffer i don't think it does if there's anything they do well it's put on a good show um is it as good as esl that's like really i say that i i don't think so i don't think it's quite that good and maybe not even as good as like uh some of the starcraft stuff that you see but like Overall, it's a perfectly quality show. Okay. Like, I wouldn't have any real complaints about that. I've seen people talking in the chat. Uh, there's some controversy because one of the best casters over in Korea actually was, uh, was told he can't come to Worlds this year, and no one really understands why. Hmm. Riot does have a lot of drama behind uh, it, and that's one of the problems with them running everything. It's their it. way or the highway. Him, aren't they? Huh? They're Kojima-ing him, aren't they? <laughs> uh, good callback to the Video Game Awards. Yeah, there we go. I wonder... Th- isn't it right about now that we would have been seeing the video game awards? Whatever happened to that shit? Did that just go away? I'm sorry, I don't mean to derail the conversation, no, but I just I this occurred to me the other day. What happened? Is hap- it about the time? I feel like when did we do that show? That was early on in the run. We celebrated our year. I uh, feel is, is it still Spike that does it? No. It's coming December 1st. Oh, May. December. Okay. Okay. Hmm. All right. It doesn't really make sense to have Video Game oh, Awards yep. when we still have months left. Oh, man. Just, uh, video Game Awards also coming out before The Last Guardian. Hey! Nailed it! <laughs> it's going to be a good day. Oh, my God. How? I hope this... they get some like, fake award like the longest delayed game goes to. Honest to God, The Last Guardian better be fucking amazing. That That game better fucking blow you when you open the package because, like... This is ridiculous. I'm sure it'll blow. Don't you worry. Uh, I, and and the thing is, is I really like. After ten years, the last game that they made was Shadow of the Colossus, right? Wow, was it really? Was it? Uh, was that the last game that they made? I think it was before oh they started God. work on the Last Guardian. I think. I think it was. Was Ico before? Or after Ico that? was before. Oh my God. Ico was before. It's taken this long. I'm not sure that they even have the chops to pull it off. I'm not sure that that's they do. insane. I mean, that's it's fucking ridiculous how many pieces of hardware that this is moved between. Come on, guys, get your shit together. Yeah, get the game out. God damn, it's frustrating too because they generally make games that are well liked universally. Like, uh, well, of the few that they have put out, yes, have they, they made have been a very, real bad one yet. Very well received. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, this may be it though. Apparently, we're being told that at uh, TGS, the Last Guardian's demo was not well received. Ooh. Maybe yeah, that's why I, I had also. Delayed. I think I had also heard that. I, re- I recall Ooh. also hearing that that it it didn't didn't go over terribly well. It's not good. It's Oof. not good. Yikes. Um. So yeah. Uh, uh, now going back to esports. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, so I do think that you know again if you're trying to take a league and make it competitive in terms of eyeballs because you know if you can't pull down the the audience numbers then there's no you're not even going to be given an opportunity to get more exposure on places like you well, know like we're starting to see like tbs and espn and, well, and stuff like that and you want to even reach wider than that what do you think is the better way to go about it this at this point do you do the riot strategy and say we're going to run everything or do you contact mlg and say hey host our game too <sighs> what, which way do you go is it better to do it in-house or out of house well, if you're if you're the company, if you're Riot, I think it's probably better to do it in-house because it gives you the most control. 
for the sport or the concept itself, I think it's better to to get everything unified. Yeah, because at at some point it's going to start get getting confusing which teams or which competitors are in which leagues or involved yeah. with which when leagues. When it finally comes down to it, when we actually finally have like an official professional video game league, if Riot's not in on that, like like if there's two competing leagues and one of them is going to be called, the other one's gone. It's, you know, it's that, that's it. You know, you go the way of of. Vince McMahon's, you know, extreme football or whatever. So you know, that's that's kind of an interesting point, Robbie. Because I, I mean, you know, like if if they well, you're bringing what? up Vince McMahon is interesting because oh, we're okay. almost <laughs> looking at the old wrestling territories. That's kind of what this is going to be. It's going to be a lot of the old territories where each of them has their own champion and stuff. But eventually, the most popular one's going to come and swallow them up. Yeah, but I think that that's kind. Of, there's a part of it that that's natural. You know, there's mm-hmm. going to be a shaking out of who yeah. ends up becoming the most popular. Sure. And it never really occurred to me until you had said it a minute ago, Robbie. But like, it could be that Riot is holding out just to see who ends up leading the pack, and that they make sure that they have the most tenable agreement with with that leader. That, okay, so you don't think that they could like a- end up like being screwed because they're not the most popular but at the last minute they're going to throw in with who they're going to th- yeah they're going to throw in with whoever that would also probably be the tipping point too it probably would mm-hmm. it, it probably would because oh, they've yeah. also they've also developed resources that you know if you if you decide to throw all your weight behind a specific oh, league oh yeah all of that all of those resources can be devoted o- or you know diverted what? over there too that's smart that is smart. If that's what they did, I would not be surprised, nor would I... Yeah, I think it's a very smart move. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, that I mean, that's a possibility. Because it does seem very... It does seem like a very interesting decision for the game developer to control all of you know all aspects of the competitive aspect of the game as well yes it's a that's a that's a lot of effort to be exerted over uh you know one one area of your game that you know if it's successful that's a good gamble if it's not successful i mean think of think of games that have come out that are designed to be competitive that have just not been successful uh fucking uh what it battle uh, battleborn battle stillborn battleborn battle what what is it it's called battle 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 stillborn yeah that sounds about right jeez uh yeah, it, it, you know, if if you have a game like that, then, you know, that becomes instantly difficult to support without a community. So, uh yeah, it's 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 interesting because it's sort of like the the chicken and the egg, you right. know, which like, comes first. Yeah, which comes first? Do you do you support your burgeoning competitive scene on the off chance that it becomes a thing or do you wait for it to become a thing and you lose a degree of control well and the other thing is that people have concerns that they've crested as uh competitors i mean they've grown by leaps and bounds for each of the last four years this year not so much i wouldn't say i wouldn't say league has expanded in the last year there by any means. is a peak they, i mean I there think definitely they is a peak um do so, you think that overwatch played any role in that i think so i would definitely think so yeah yeah, having playing the game, yeah, that it, it definitely uh, the popularity of, of it, the the yeah. the uh, reception of it, the competitiveness of it, the uh, ease of which it translates over to a competitive environment, all of those things. I do think that that probably ate into League of Legends. Mm-hmm. Um, it certainly did from their creative uh, 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 content creators. I'd be interested to know, uh, you know, what engagement looks like because I I would think that engagement probably around the time that Overwatch came out came uh, probably went down. Yeah, I remember seeing some pretty nasty looking charts. Yeah. It, I mean, it probably is, but the nice thing about League is that's not particularly noticeable if you're not like in the high end of ranked. No, but I mean, in terms of your point to uh, whether or not the the trend for the game has peaked, sure, that, yeah, I, I think that that's a good point. And then and then that also rain, uh, raises another question: Riot doesn't have a very diversified game platform. They pretty much have banked on League. Yes. So the instant that League fails, the uh, all of the media and all of the 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 league stuff around league of legends also instantly fails as and well it has confirmed they have new games in development but no word yet on what they might be but they are working on new games so they're not planning to stick to that 
But that says to me that seems, they don't see the long term future of. Yeah, anymore. that seems unsustainable for the long term. Yeah, I mean, again, if they're if if they are holding out to get, to to allow you know their momentum to be put behind uh, whichever league shows the most promise, that's smart. If they're trying to do this for just games on their uh, on their development schedule and their platform and in their wheelhouse, then I don't think that that's smart because you will have games that come out like Overwatch that end up eating into what becomes your bottom line. And you know, it's it's entirely possible that they're not trying to support the concept of esports, and that they are just trying to support their game and the promotion of it, and the way Definitely that possible. it is, it, you know, that the way that it is characterized out in the gaming media and in the competitive scene. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's two ways. There's two ways that that could go. It could either be a very smart KG move, or it could end up coming around to bite them in the ass. And that's how. That's how. Because if they don't produce another game that captures the imagination like League of Legends did, yeah. then the success or failure of their media, uh, you know, their their media market is, is entirely dependent on League of Legends' success or failure. It's already an aging game that has, as Callie had mentioned, peaked. Yep. And... You, there is no next step well, too. And, uh, they shouldn't have problems like expanding games out of what League is. League's provided them with their world of Runeterra and lots of characters that people know and sure. like. There should be lots of opportunity to build out of that. Oh yeah, they've definitely got another IP in there. But yes. I mean, again, it, it, they could be lightning in a bottle too. Could We've be. seen developers only be able to be one note developers. Oh yeah. I mean, that's entirely possible too. So again, as soon as the interest for that dies off, they've got a very real problem of how that model becomes sustainable for the long term future and growth. And the instant that that becomes dead weight on an on an ailing company that's going to get cut because again as we said you've got to run it in the red to be able to put the amount of of right. audience behind it that it needs to be able to remain competitive or be able to in the long term succeed and again you know i i think that that bet is a way clearer way better bet on a diversified league that has interests in more than one game title unlike riot oh i would absolutely like if we're talking 10 years from now i would absolutely put my money on gsl esl mlg any of them yeah like having a diversified lineup that's constantly bringing in new games yeah that's probably the way to go i think the weird thing in there is the genres of games like exact because there's a big division among you know you get a lot of uh uh fighting game representation out at something fighting, like Evo. shooters rts moba right it's all over the place it, it is all over the place and different leagues will you know they they allow competition for different games mm-hmm. and at what point you know does does the biggest league does the leader out of this have to pick the most popular games or do they have to pick the most interesting to watch games? I mean, because that's that's a very real problem too. Because you want to have what you're watching be compelling, but you also want it to have the popularity enough to drive numbers. Well, I mean, you look at like the NCAA and what they have to deal with. There's not just college football, right. but that's what most people care about. Right. But they do still have college hockey, college baseball, college basketball, swimming, lacrosse, everything. Right. It does still exist. Although it may be harder to find. And I think that'll probably be the, the model they'll go with eventually, where the biggest games will be right on the, on the website, easy to find, easy to go for. And the smaller games, yeah, they will have lesser development or lesser production value put into them. And, and well, and not just that, but I mean, like, if you're competitive in one of those games, let's say Smash. If you're very sure. competitive in Smash, right? Smash is not terribly popular among the top viewed competitive games right like i would say it's probably down there in the middle of the road okay your if your most popular is like league of legends or hearthstone right like smash brothers does not pull the numbers that those games do when you're talking about being viewed on twitch or any other kind of streaming platform okay so if you're a, if you're a smash player and you have dreams of being competitive and having success if we shrink down to only having one definitive league sure. what happens when smash is no longer a supported game by that league 
What happens? I mean, because the, you know they'd have to make a choice like that. Oh yeah, at Those some point. Happen. Uh, what happens if Smash isn't given the visibility that? league you know league players are given mm -hmm. if someone is really good at smash why shouldn't they be given the same you know the same opportunities to succeed as i mean you know like obviously it has a lot to do with popularity but i think that you know that's a valid that's a valid concern and a valid question even if you know especially if we're talking about condensing the number of leagues but we're, you're also talking about the real world if you go to college and you know hey i'm i like swimming that's my thing your financial goal or your visibility like potential is far more limited than if you're a quarterback okay or a wide receiver like mm -hmm. that's a problem that everyone faces in the real world if you are not competitive on the popular games then people are not going to want to watch as much like that is a that's a reality you're going to face and that's the reality that you face in any sport i, I yeah that's true but at the same time though uh, you know there is there's exposition for most of that. If there's one league that controls every, you know, if there was one league that, like you had mentioned with the NCAA, if there was one league that controlled all of sports, right? Right. And who got what exposure on outlets like ESPN, right? I think we would have a very different presentation of of sports in general, yeah. right? Like if you had one governing body that that oversaw hockey, football, sure. uh basketball, all of those different leagues, right? I think that's sort of what you're talking about. I think a game genre defines itself separately enough that I mean, you could have you could have a structure where you have leagues for different genres of games. But you're going to have the same problem within those leagues because there's going to be fighting games that are more popular than other ones. But it doesn't... Uh, when when you're a competitor, though, what you're concerned about are prize pots. What you're concerned about is your ability to be able to compete and be able to live sure. off, of, off of that competition. Sure. So, you know, I think having a more diverse amount a, a, a more you know like a, the the higher number of leagues like the more potential that you get for higher prize pots because those leagues are competing with each other right. to be the definitive smash brothers league or the definitive whatever league sure but you, i think you're still going to run into the same issue of hey i'm i'm playing i play the fourth most popular game in the fighting genre and that's it's and that has limiting factors yeah. that go along with it i think the, i think no matter how you do it you're going to run into those same problems yeah. whether it's one large league that's running all games or a bunch of smaller leagues that each run a genre you're always gonna run into that the other option is every game has its own league but now we're back to square one with what riot's doing yeah yeah exactly so how do you how do you organize it my guess is we'll see something kind of ncaa ish where like like is is ncaa is college hockey profitable probably not does it live off the success of college football Yes, it does. Sure. And I think that's eventually what you'll see. Well, the college has got to find money to spend somewhere, you know what uh, I mean? Like, don't they, though? Yeah, they've got to find holes Let in that budget. Let me ask you guys this, what? all right? Because we, we're, we're, we're operating under the assumption that uh. this is going to you know, end up playing out sort of like how sports do, right? You only have so many stations. You only have so many channels. You only have so many places you can put these sports. But when video games have essentially came from a generation of streaming and web space, do you really have to decide, like, oh, we don't have the space for this sport, so let's just cut it? Um, I, I mean, no, because, it, and I mean, I guess that's the media world that we live in, because if you want content, you can seek it out, you can find it. Sure. Period. Um, but I think when you talk about representation on, you know, things like ESPN and major media outlets, you're talking about how how well that thing has worked its way into the narrative or into the social consciousness, the social fabric of you know the country that you're in or the or espn versus the espn8 which one are you going to be on yeah right. exactly exactly and i think the end goal for esports as a concept is to be competitive with things like the nba yeah i think that lends it a lot of credibility it lends it a lot of legitimacy and i think more people would would find that they like it if they were exposed to it with an open mind with an open mind it's, sure it's, Fair enough. i mean you see it all the time people take one look at it and don't even 
take a second to like engage with it right Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it it, and and there is that element to it too where it at first you know it does kind of feel a little bit nerdy it's not you don't have the instant camaraderie with people that you do when you go to a bar and watch a baseball game because you've got sports ball yeah i mean there there is it's easier to to find that camaraderie because that's a well-worn path maybe what we need is we need teams that have a city attached to them like they do in sports. It's not a bad you feel idea. that camaraderie because you're all rooting for the Detroit Tigers it's if you're here. You're all rooting for your city's team. You don't get that in esports. Yeah, but then you might root I, for the NA team. But I mean, when you talk about ESL, you're talking about, you know, you've only got two, three, maybe four teams that are competing and representing the entire country of the United States. Right. And that's because the sport hasn't grown quite to the level where I think you could you could you know break it down like that i think if they took more of an effort put more of an effort into building where the teams are from and who they represent you would get that kind of tie like if we saw a team like you but see, that that comes that comes with a regional league that focuses yes. on the united states as its region even, but even if like they you saw a starcraft tournament and they made more of a deal like hey here's a player in competitive starcraft who's actually from the united states it's not a common thing right but if they actually like really like build that up and that was just on the background in some bar somebody like hey that guy's actually is from the is from the united states i'll root for him right and even if that's all it is to get you to just kind of watch it in the background you might hook some people doing that yeah yeah. I don't know. Esports exists in this really weird place uh, because, it, 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 you know, you could look at it like the formation of any other sports league. And, uh, you know, it, it, it there's a lot of parallels that you could draw. But the thing is, is that a lot of these leagues were formed before 24 hour news networks and yeah. high media and constant media. So we don't we, we have a narrative uh, like this very like strict narrative of history that presents like how these sports leagues ended up becoming into existence. The actual reality and the competitiveness and the, uh, you know, of the actual leagues with other leagues, like wrestling was a great example of this because that did happen in, in a period where there was, a, you know, a lot of people still remember it and know what the story is, and sure. and and you can find people that felt the 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 pain of that industry constricting and getting smaller, but some of that needs to happen. Like having having professional wrestling that was regional wasn't going to work for uh you know a constantly media connected society absolutely and in the same way you know as this grows in popularity that is also it's weird that it it's going from the macro to the micro you know like we have uh nationally competitive teams as right. opposed to uh you know regionally competitive i and i think eventually seeing those regional uh, teams pop up will be big because that will yeah. give you a sense of camaraderie. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I and I think I actually think you do see some of these regional leagues, but there's no way that they're getting the exposure or the funding mm-hmm. to be able to work their way into the consciousness like places like you know riots presentations or the sure. ESL. And another thing is like NA teams have been. In, in the esports scene, we've been dominated in a lot of games for so long by places like Korea, Japan, China, where That's it's just like too. you just kind of know you're going to lose. But if but there was finally, if there was more interest, I think if, if there was more interest on the media end and it, and it was exposed to more people and and people knew like oh this is a thing that I could do yes that that would encourage I mean we would have way more competitive players coming out of North America I think yeah I think. Yeah, exactly. And we're seeing that. Over the last couple of years, I think NA has stepped up. I think they have gotten better. A lot of people are expecting an NA team to make it to the finals this year, which that's not happened. Right. So, hey, if that can happen here, next thing, like we need to get a StarCraft player in there who can actually go all the way because that's never happened. But Right. Outside of that, NA is becoming more competitive. Esports is becoming more accepted over here. We're catching up to something that Korea has already had going for a long time in that aspect. And yeah, I think as you start seeing people over here where it becomes socially acceptable to be a pro gamer. Yeah, Grandma, there's a future in it. (laughs) God damn it. Kind of, yeah. Uh, Right now, there is very much that stigma that there is no future playing video games. That's still very prevalent in America. So, you know, something I was thinking about the other day uh is it is it weird do you do any of you guys 
play games at work or like have any because the the way my job works i have a lot of downtime either something is processing on a computer or i'm waiting for the next commercial block to hit i have a lot of downtime and i've got to keep myself occupied and in fact gaming is something that it's in a lot of ways encouraged in my industry as a way to you know stay awake yeah. if nothing else don't you fall know. asleep at the board yeah exactly <clears throat> and i i, I mean i'm just kind of curious like would it, it, it uh, first of all do you ever game in front of your coworkers and if you if you don't would it make you strange uh, would it make you feel strange to game in front of your coworkers well i work in retail yeah. so no <laughs> i have <laughs> definitely never played pokemon on the 3DS at work in the back room like or in front of people that is like not a lying. thing that i do feel like you're lying no, no, that and, would get me fired, Nate. <laughs> and given that I uh, work in pizza delivery, I definitely do not. Why uh, do you tell your coworkers about this show? <laughs> that's what I, I. That's what I'm. As, as I ask this question now, that's what I'm wondering. I don't. It occurs to me all my coworkers know about this show too. I mean, they mm. like know that I do it, but they don't know, like how to find it. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I, I, I like. Would it make you feel weird? Because sometimes I do. I have to admit, around certain people, because I have the ability, and, and I admit, I, I, I've got a bit of a privilege here, so I'm checking my privilege, but <laughs> around certain people that I work with, I feel really weird when one of them will walk into the studio and I'll be on my 3DS, right? Like it, And it's only specific people, and it's not my boss, by the way. Mm -hmm. like, it's I'm, just people who view video games is still just being like like a thing that kids do yes like you're playing pokemon right and i feel like among certain co-workers like there are people who see me different because they know i i play video games mm -hmm. um but i've kind of I, I at some point i think like i've had to let it go and kind of embrace the fact that look i do fucking i make content about video games like this is kind of an extension of what i want to do professionally are, uh, I, don't, I, I I've had to stop caring. Are yeah. the people who you feel that way around, just out of curiosity, are yeah. they either the same age or older than you? Yes. Actually. I think that's I think that's still very much a stigma that existed when it we is, grew up as kids is that is good. not there ten years younger than us right now. I don't think that will be a problem forever. I think in the next ten years you'll see that go away. It's people yep. our age and up where we we're playing games still has that nerd stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. But people who are I younger, they don't care. Everyone plays video games now. So every once in a while, it would be an older person, too. But they have to say something to make me feel self-conscious about it. Sure. I I've never felt self-conscious about it. Because, I mean, everyone knows, obviously, that I play games. And they've seen me playing them on my break. So it's never felt weird before. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I guess at my old job, I, I worked with a lot of old, uh, you know older folks. I didn't work with a ton of people my age. And... Uh, I, I, th when I would get a lot of questions about it, like, hey, what's that? Like, I'd, I even, I would use my Vita a lot to watch Netflix and do, like, really not even gaming stuff. And I would not, I, and, and it would annoy me if I didn't have a game up. If it was just Netflix and they were like, what is, what is that? What is that? Yeah. And it was kind of like, oh, God damn it. Like, it's a thing where I'm watching the, f really? I'm watching a movie. I'm watching cartoons. Okay, fine. Whatever. I'll, I'll be nice. But, I, I, it's it, you're you're right. I there is this thing like people our age that aren't like you know that they're not necessarily down with it or you know they <laughs> down with it. Yeah, yeah, like they're not you know they're not gamers themselves. Yeah. Like yeah, that feels a little weird. But video games have become so ingrained in our culture and so that mainstream who, yeah. that people who grow up today they there that stigma doesn't exist anymore. I don't <laughs> think. Yeah, it's, I think that is that is one that goes out with our generation. Good. Yeah, yeah, thank God. But good. You're welcome, like, like, younger guys yeah. and girls. Yeah. Younger viewers. That's right. We are uh paving the way Pioneers. to make your life better. Get thrown to the back of the bus for playing our three DS. You kids don't know how good you have it today. <laughs> they don't with their iPhones at age four. Get out of here. Yep. I remember my big clunky gray Game Boy that oh, yeah. eight batteries. I remember oh, yeah. that. Yep. You had so to bring you had to bring eight batteries. 
just because you knew it ate batteries. You know, and you had, had to throw them out four at a time, but bring eight just in case. And I had a game gear. And had to fend off the bullies. Why? So the smart thing was to put them in a sock. So then you could just sock them. There with you it. go. Yeah. I owned a game gear because there was no internet to tell me, hey, this thing's garbo. <laughs> Don't buy it. <laughs> Oh, man. So I said, oh, I can play my Sega games on a handheld? That's amazing. Oh, wait, I can only do it for five minutes before the batteries run out. I have started to feel a bit the same way about Pokemon Go a little bit. That it, that it went from, like, hey, it's this huge, like, everyone is doing it to now, yeah, everyone checked it out, but the people who are still playing it, like, the, the, from the people who checked it out, there's, like, really? You're still into that? Like, that's still a thing that's going? It's a, That's a... <laughs> Oh, that was so like three weeks ago. What the- oh my god! One of my coworkers is so anti Pokemon Go at this point, where he's just like every time you mention, he's like, "Oh, that game's dead. No one's playing that anymore." Like, Shut up. Go away. Yes, they are. There's uh, is- still plenty, plenty of people playing it. Yeah, just it's it, it's funny because I've I've noticed a lot of dis disaffected people who live in shitty spawn areas that <laughs> that say that. And it's just like, mm. look, you're just sick of catching Weedles. I get it. I Northern, understand. I understand. No, I don't hold that bitch. against you. Yeah, right. But, you know, you could try. Like, there's there's a bit of effort that you could put into it and try just a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's funny because it, it, it really... Yeah, you, the... the uh, blind prejudice that people are seeming to get around that game is uh, is pretty hilarious. And every once in a while, when I'm out and playing it, and I have it in front of me, and I have you know I'm looking at the screen, I'll kind of feel a little bit awkward mm. about it. It kind of it's another reason that I sort of want the Pokemon Go Plus. Yeah, then you can be in the closet and not have that's everyone right. know that you're playing. That's right. Just keep it in your pocket, pressing the button. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, we've got an email. Let's uh, let's at least read one of these emails before we wrap up here. Uh, who wants to read this email? Somewhere? I do. Okay. First one right there. Sure. All right. Uh, so this email comes to us from Lesote, who I actually believe is in the chat today. With last week's show talking about the recent free-to-play option for EVE, as someone who has spent a considerable amount of time in EVE, I thought I'd throw my own two cents in. Okay. I haven't been plugged into that game for a few months now, but I do know the game, its meta, and the community fairly well. I've also started talking to my old core mates about this. First, EVE was the first MMO to use in-game currency to buy sub-time. You've been able to trade Plex, an in-game item, with 30 days of game time since 2008. Hang on. Was that the first though? I don't think. That, uh, I, I think. I think they're 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 using quotations. So I don't know if that's something that that we said last episode or not. Um, I want to say that the very first time I was ever conscious of a model like that was Second Life. Was that it? Ugh. I think it was Second Life. That's not a game where you could. Um, it, it, there was something. Was there a sub feed a Second Life? I mean, yeah, maybe there wasn't. I don't think there was a sub feed. I don't for that think game. there was. There wasn't. No. no. But you could buy currency in that game. No, you could sell currency for real money. You could get real oh. money back out of it. That's what it was. That's what it was. Now I remember. All right. Sorry. At the time, this sent Eve's incredibly deep economy into some crazy direction, but this legal RMT part of the economy has mostly stabilized since. Lots of people use real money on top of their sub to buy Plex for real money, then sell it in-game for ISK, Interstellar Credits, the game's actual currency. At where I was in the game, if I farmed for a couple days, I could easily buy Plex in-game to pay for my sub, but time is money, and I just paid for my sub. Second, since early this year, EVE has had a skill trading system. You don't level up in EVE. You set this schedule for days, weeks, months, or years ahead of time for what skills you want to learn so you can fly bigger ships. The grind of EVE isn't leveling up. It's making money. With skill trading, you can extract your skills, put them on the market in-game, then someone can buy the skill points. Hmm. What this combined with buying Plex meant that a rich player was able to pour $28,000 into the game to get all the skills in the game on himself at once. Pay to win. With both these changes, the community threw a fit. As well And then eventually should. moved on. Eve also tried years back to put in a microtransaction shop. The community was so outraged they took it out. However, a few years later, they put in another one in for cosmetics, and people got over it this time. Turns out no one in EVE gives a shit about cosmetics. They're playing a 2003 game. 
With this new system of playing for free, I initially thought it would actually hurt the game. The game still makes its money fairly well, while subs are down compared to past years. It's still competitive, even with Final Fantasy XIV, when you consider that with XIV, people come and go with patches, and with EVE, people stay subbed all the time. Most longtime players actually multi-box anywhere between 2 to 10 different accounts at once, mm -hmm. which is an intended feature, and use it for activities like farming faster or having a couple different scouts up to see if any unfriendlies show up. Initially, I figured that people would unsub and play on their free accounts, but recently I was informed that you have to use pay-to-play accounts in order to multi-box. What I do think this will do for the game is open it up for a lot of new people. The criticism of EVE is that you tend to be in small ships for the first year or so, and at least skill trading allowed people to get into bigger ships faster. That said, while a few dozen frigates might not be too scary, 7,000 frigates full of bloodthirsty noobs can take down a lot in the game with some support. Yeah. The free-to-play yeah, option will probably let some people stick around for that more boring first year because it'll be free. For other players who play the meta game or the market, they actually probably won't have to sub now because they don't actually get most of their shit done in-game. At its heart, EVE is a platform for the most crazy kinds of PvP in and in the game stock market. In corporate espionage and in marshalling several thousands of players at once in massive battles. I highly recommend Andrew Gruen's book, Empires of Eve, a really interesting short book chronicling all hmm. the conflicts that have taken place over the years that give people a window into probably the most unique MMO out there. I actually would be into reading that. It's, I might actually, yeah, too. I yeah. might actually read that. That I seems actually, fascinating. I actually, I actually get pretty excited when like Eve makes these headlines, like these huge battles with these awesome stories. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, my oh God. the fucking Goon Squad. The, yeah. way, Goon the way, yeah, the way the fucking something awful ran and tr just trolled the shit out of people on that game for two, like two, three years solid, and I don't even know if it's still running. But the way that it would They've make headlines, destroyed. holy fuck, was that amazing! Oh my god, Kyle plays Eve, and I'll just listen for him to tell me story, like listen for hours to stories about like what happens in Eve. It's so interesting. It really is, and I, I, mean, I don't want to play it, but I love hearing about it. Yeah, the, uh, just I, like its history and stuff, how it actually yes. has like its own history. Yes, yeah. I think that's, that's fucking that's fascinating. Not, that's not like. You know, in WoW or Final Fantasy, it has a story that the devs right. are creating. It's just all player created. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very cool. Uh, even people I know that haven't played the game have enjoyed it and have uh, informed themselves about it. You can apparently get it on Kindle for $10. Huh. Uh, I hope that that is enlightening for people who haven't played EVE. As someone who played EVE and Final Fantasy XI, oh my, my static God. believes I'm a masochist. Uh, Smiley yeah. face, Lesote. Uh, thanks, Lesote, for the email. We appreciate it. Uh, and, yeah, a little peek into EVE and uh, the way that that game was run. I know that we didn't, uh, a lot of us didn't uh, play EVE, and we sort of used that story as a way to kind of, you know, get into the validity of subscription models in MMOs. But it is interesting to look at because, you know, I think EVE is a game that knows exactly what it is, yep. that knows exactly what its fan base wants, and, you know, how to achieve that. Like, it's it's a game that didn't try to be something that it's not. It never put Lords of Verminion in the game. Well, yeah, no, I mean, they, I, no, they have made their colossal blunders. They have, which was just base, outlined by yeah. Lesote. Yeah. And their fan base literally rioted. I don't mean they sent angry letters. I mean they found a statue that couldn't be blown up and had everyone shoot at it until the servers crashed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They it, literally rioted. I, I mean, EVE players are fairly notorious for their in-game demonstrations when they don't like a feature that's added. But what's interesting is the way that EVE would change and adapt to those wants of those players. And it was a game that at some point said, all right, we're not going to get any more people. Like, attracting new people to this game, not going to happen. Never. We need to We need to focus on the people who are playing right now. Yeah. And I think that that's an important development strategy, especially for an ongoing development like an MMO, a persistent world. And it's it, it, having the will and the bravery to say, all right, we're going to call it on trying to pick up new subs. We've got to focus on what we have. Like, there's some balls that's required there. That's why they're still alive after 13 years. That's why they're still running. Yeah. I think the game, and, and the games that know that do well. Like, they stay around long term. Yep. So. Final Fantasy 14, take note. <clears throat> Please. Please take note. <laughs> Please. Please. Uh, all right. That's going to be it. 
Actually, you know what? We've only got one more email. Why don't we clear this out? Not so we don't have any more emails for next week. Sounds uh, good. Yeah, two emails. Uh, two? Is it two? Yeah, it's, it's two. two. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. fuck well, it. Let's you know what? Why don't Chris take one and Callie take one? Fine. Hey, FEC crew. This is the short one, right? You read. Yes, the short it's one. a short one, dumbass. Thank God. I recently started working on my massive backlog of games. Uh, this is from David. Uh, I'm playing through uh, using a, quote, hit and run method because I don't want to waste a lot of time forcing myself to play a game I don't enjoy. So far, I've come to terms with the fact that I don't seem to like some games that everyone else likes. And that's okay. While my personal tastes don't align with certain games, I can definitely appreciate what they bring to the table. Are there any games that you all personally don't care for despite the acclaim that they receive but uh, completely understand and appreciate the game for what it's done for the industry and the question. culture of gaming? Mm-hmm. Mm, personally, totally. yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've gotten, honestly, a ton of, like, like probably more than you guys, thanks to Ryoku. <laughs> I have so many games on Steam. Yeah. And a lot of times people, sometimes, most of the time the They'll buy it off your, your wish list for you. That's cool. But sometimes people want to share with you, you know, a, a game that means a lot to them. And sure. this really makes me feel bad. I'm finally have to come clean about it now. Um, now, I still plan on giving them a try, <laughs> but I'm just, I am not a fan of, like, retro side-scrollery type games, right? Like like Shovel Knight? Shovel Knight, yeah. Shovel Knight mm-hmm. seems pretty cool, and, and I know a lot of people like it, but the, the few times that I've played it, I, I, sh- I struggle to keep myself interested. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, now, I recently, I, I played Shantae. Uh, that was kind of similar, but something, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, maybe it's all the pixelated boobs. But Definitely that was boobs. a little bit easier. I got through a, through a little bit more of that. But, you know, another one that, that Ryoko got me, which uh, I promised him I'd play with him someday, and I, and I will, uh, Double Dragon Neon. Um, you know, another okay. one where inherently... I don't have like a desire to play it myself. You know, that's never something that I would have bought for myself. So yes, when it comes to, to retro games, uh, uh, Crip, for example, I'm sure, ob- obviously, obviously, uh, Undertale is amazing. I'll probably never play it. That's a shame. You should. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, sure. Coming from a guy who's also never played it, but it just uh, goes to show you that uh, Robbie doesn't like good games. <laughs> fucking for me, JRPGs. Big time, yeah. which is confusing because I own so many of them. Final Fantasy. There was there was an era where I really liked JRPGs, and I don't know if that was an era in their development or if it was an era in my life. Uh, it's called high school. I don't. But see, the thing is, is I was never that into anime because you you would yeah. th- you would think like the reason I feel like I don't like JRPGs anymore is how much they borrow from anime. There was a point where I feel like they didn't or that what they're borrowing from anime is just not not context that I have. Like the early run of PlayStation Square games, right? Like, yeah, okay, uh, uh, what's uh, the fucking... Xenogears is probably the most anime-inspired out of that, right? Like, uh, you can yeah. see you can see it's definite anime-ish. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. But... I feel like there were other there were tons of other games that were inspired maybe visually by anime but didn't have the moe bullshit in there that drives me fucking crazy. Sure. I, I I mean a lot of early Square games I think are have this like um, I think you're okay with the anime aesthetic but not the personality. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I, you know, there, that's also an era that didn't see much voice acting too. That may have been that a probably big, helps. That yeah. may have been a big part of it because it was after PS2 that it lost me big time, big time. It, I had a big fall off for, uh, and that's why I never got, I never, I never gave Sweek it in a shot because I was so sick of finding anime bullshit in JRPGs. So I, I think knowledge that didn't it, it was the aesthetic, but that didn't have much of the personality. I cannot think of like a good example of a game I feel this way about, but I have a movie. I hate okay, we're skipping you then. The Big Lebowski. Count. Really, I hate that movie. I don't think it's funny at all, and everyone thinks it's like the next coming of Jesus for comedy. Never seen it. Really? Yeah, I've I never heard of it. Test that movie. Really? Yeah. Huh. That's too bad. And, and that's kind of like, everyone's like, oh, really? It's kind of your sense of humor, too. That's weird. And I was like, no, it's not. It's, 
It's you know not what? I kind of want to watch it now just so we have some more ammunition against Callie. I, like, <laughs> I love, I like every actor in it, and I hate that movie. Huh. We need big Lebowski drops, Chris. Okay. I can't. I actually can't think of a movie that I should like, but I don't. I I can think of games that I should like, but I don't. But not movies. That's weird. That's weird that you can't think of a game. Yeah. But I can't think of a movie hmm. that that's applicable to. Yeah. That's hmm. super weird. Um, for games that I don't like that uh, other people do like, it's a very small segment. Uh, it's basically any game that's created in like you know 2003 and beyond. <laughs> Um, like three day Undertale or was or three D games with like like Batman Arkham game and Creed of Assassins with Bioware's shooting the effects. I've, like I've, I've, all I've, those games. No, don't I? It's just completely lost. I feel like we're setting ourselves up for stream requests, very specific stream requests from people. Uh, I will have you guys know. I want to like, see. I want to see Chris play the- Creed Assassins <laughs> stuff. Oh, that's coming. Something like that's coming. <laughs> Great. <Yeah. laughs> oh, I can't wait for that. All right, let's get this last email. All right. Oh, hold on. It's not done yet. Oh. oh you well, cut David off. Well, Poor sorry. Guy. What do you have, like one line left? Pretty much. Uh, personally, I'm not a fan of Mega Man, but I completely understand the appeal. It's just not for me. Castlevania was never one that really hit home. I never played Love it. Love Castlevania. It looks me fun. I, I, You know, I was, I was into the characters, like... You know the Belmonts as as a concept, but I could never I could never get far enough into the game. I was mm, never into Metroid. It. Really? No, oh, Metroid. That's an interesting one. Yeah, still, that I, is that's interesting, especially coming from you, Mister Nintendo Bubble. Yeah, coming from you, uh, new Nintendo Bubble inductee. I think I don't think I, owning like four Nintendo games total is not quite. Oh, you're part of the bubble. I'm you sorry, I can't hear bubble. you from inside the bubble. <laughs> what was that? I'm not gonna. <laughs> Thanks for reading email from David. Thanks, David. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Uh, hey, guys. In the last Final Encounter cast, Nate questioned the validity of the assertion that the FF15 delay was to avoid a day one patch because he questioned what can they really do in two months. Yes. this We re- we referenced this email at the open of the show. I'm mm-hmm. glad we decided to clear out all the emails. It's not necessarily an issue of work to be done, but work already done, that they want to be on the shipped discs. So what can they r- really do in two months? Delay the uh, production of discs, which when you're dealing with millions may take a fair bit of time to get printed, boxed, shipped, etc. This is the core of why day one patches exist. There is always a gap time between disc printing and release for yeah. physical supply as well as marketing reasons. Most, and most people understand that. But the thing is, is I'm going to, and again, I predicted it in the segment. I'm going to predict it again right now. There is still, with the delay, going to be a day one patch. And it's going to be 40 gigs or above. I mean, it's going to be you know, fucking huge. Maybe that was the point then. Had they not done this delay, you'd have been looking at like an 80, 90 gig update. It's and still the and fact that it's taking bandwidth. two months. <laughs> yeah, that, that it, might actually be out of their hand because if they then have to delay the printing of the discs, the company that they're going to might be all right. Well, then you know what? We're not going to be able to get to it until this time. So they don't necessarily need two more months. That's just kind of like how it ended up sussing out. Well, if that's the case, then just fucking. I don't know. Just put out the day one download. Make it big. Fine. Fuck it. Like I think that I've never the, had a problem with day one patches. No, it neither do I. Bug me. No, no, neither do I. It just means that you've been supporting your product right until the eleventh hour, and that's not a bad. That's not a bad thing. I, I, it just it either says something is so drastically wrong or so drastically broken with the game experience that we have to push this off for two months, yeah. or. As, as this person is saying, a way to avoid the day one downloads and have that be so sizable. But again, I, if if this game comes out and there's still a day one download, what was the fucking point of the delay? Especially after, it, like you've pointed out, they're big showing. Yes! If, if anyone can explain that to me, I I don't know. Well, I'll, like, and I'll it's blow like, you. Let's say there's a 40 gig <laughs> day one patch. How long is that going to take to download? Probably a while, but not two months. Right, exactly. <laughs> We're just gonna That's gloss a... over the fact that in here's gonna or, uh, Nate's gonna blow somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't want to go into any further detail. Did you? <laughs> Yeah, let's uh, let's get some. Uh, because there's the, no way I'm wrong. Let's get the hard and dirty here. Because there's no way no, I'm no, wrong. No, not hard or dirty. No, be quiet. Yeah. 
Uh, with the advent of internet connected consoles, devs can continue working I- in that time gap. To me, it sounds like they were behind schedule a bit and would uh, still be fixing slash optimizing pretty major things during that gap. Articles about the delay mentioned data showing 20% of the Japanese consoles are not connected to the internet and Tabata wanted those players to have all those fixes as well. At least that's what he says. Because in a very practical sense, it is unlikely 15 actually had a 10 year development but cycle. But there's still going to be a day one patch. I guarantee it. I'm telling you right now, even with the two-month delay, we're going to get the game, and everyone's going to forget about the two-month delay at that point, and there's still going to be a day one patch, and they're never going to justify or explain the two-month delay. I, I, I mean, no one else is frustrated by this? Like, oh, I don't Because care. I'm at the point where I never cared about FF15 anyway, so no. Yeah, I haven't really cared tons about Square I, in a long you time. You know, I, I have to admit, I don't care that much about FF15, but it just seems like in the entire scheme and idea of developing and promoting games that this is a step backward, more towards Duke Nukem Forever territory. You're not wrong. <laughs> God damn it. I thought we had moved past this in a lot nope. of ways, like as an industry. I thought mm-hmm. we had moved past no. shit like this. No, in fact, I you might even argue that, that it's starting to become more prevalent. I mean, I was, Last yeah. Garden was probably one of the first ones that did it, right? Still doing it. FF15, Kingdom Hearts Fucking 3. Fucking Kingdom Hearts 3. 14, and, what is it, 14 years ago? 15 years ago yes, that the first game came out? the three of them are Square Enix. Jesus oh. Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Childhood completely ruined. Yeah. Uh, behind the scenes, things probably looked very f- uh, similar to the Final Fantasy XIV versus A Realm Reborn scenario. A troubled production that was scrapped and rebooted with new internal leadership. Replaced Tanaka with Nomura and Yoshi P with Tabata. The biggest difference is unlike... Stop. Th- stop. Stop. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to read this email? No. Y- yes, I do. I'm just... Uh, you well, want to read it? You no, can do it? No. no okay. No. The biggest difference is, unlike 14, the failed production didn't actually result in a game release. Final Fantasy vs. 13, as a development effort, seems to have failed comprehensively. Just as A Realm Reborn is a, an essentially different software product from 1.0, so is 15, likely an essentially different software product than vs. 13. It carries over some elements, scenario, story, uh, music certainly, and maybe some art, though just because it looks the same doesn't mean it didn't have to get remade or significantly modified to meet uh, new technical specifications. But by definition, all of the hardest work that likely caused the original effort to fail in the uh, first place of creating a run real-time RPG that actually works to console specs and all of the fully fleshed out content on top of it was left for them to do. That was the longest run-on sentence in history. Use a damn period. Assuming the effort started a year or two before it was announced it at 15. The le- I did say that. Just to me. Before it was announced at 15, uh, the length of the development effort seems pretty in line with a modern AAA title. Torco rather dashing. I just... Holy crap. I... Uh, I look, it... it Maybe, but the fact that they slapped the 15 title on it and it's it's just gone through the enormous amount of problems that it has. I mean, it's been a long time since we've seen a Final Fantasy, you know, a full title. Uh, what, what FF14 was uh, 2010 when that first came out, right? Mm-hmm. 2010. Yeah. God, was it that long ago? Yeah. Jesus. 1.0, I think, was 2010. So, I mean... You know, it's been six years since we've even seen marketing in gaming stores for a regular Final Fantasy title. Yeah. That doesn't have some kind of stupid subtitle like Brave XVS. Lightning Returns. Right? Yeah. And there's been three games of fucking lightning. Like, anyone has needed that shit. Yeah, we were all real thrilled about it. When number four? (laughs) Never. (laughs) You haven't even played the other ones. I, pl- I played number one and two. Did did you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're too happy about it. I'm sorry. Be less happy about yeah, it. Seriously. Lightning is my waifu. Don't stop being then chipper. Why'd you trade her? Stop being chipper in the face of my miserableness. <laughs> <laughs> misery. The word you're looking for is misery. <laughs> miserableness. I'm ha- I'm 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 legitimately think I legitimately think that <laughs> you guys have watched me become sick. During the course of this episode, <laughs> through You're LBR good. and through FEC, that when I woke up this morning, I was kind of feeling a little bit crappy, and then in between shows, I had a sneezing fit, mm. and I'm started as we wind down FEC, I'm like legitimately starting to feel 
congested. Like, I feel it in my chest. Yeah. Like, I might actually be getting sick. Oh, great. I'm so happy I'm here in this room with you. Yeah. I'm Can so we call it a day? I'm not. Uh, so Kelly didn't want that to didn't want that blowjob. <laughs> not now. <laughs> uh, look. Uh, thanks, guys, for the emails. We appreciate it. Um, it's uh, it's been a good show. Well, this has been a very good discussion. It was, there was a lot, a lot more from this discussion than I thought there was. I like uh, the part about blowjobs. What, what was that? Shock. What? What was that? I said I like the part about blowjobs. Oh, okay. The bold promises. Yeah. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of focus on that. He's very thrilled about it. <laughs> oh, I should I'm, have worked late tonight. I'm waiting, Daddy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> God, that's a callback. To, wrong show, ass. God damn it. All right. Back. That's uh, that's going to be it here for Final Encounter Cast. Thanks, guys. Uh, we appreciate you joining us live here on twitch.tv slash Final Encounter Cast. Uh, I... I, you know what? I, I don't. I don't know if there's good. I don't think there's a post show today. I'm gonna say. I, I think. Yeah. I, don't think so. I, I think. I think. It's, uh, Papa's not here. Yeah. Papa's not. We fired not- Lenny. Er, <laughs> we fired Skrull. <Squirrel. laughs> fucking cock rings. Cock rings. <laughs> cock rings is gone. Um. Yeah. So well, he he actually he had things to do. He had somewhere to be today. So uh, I don't think that Kooky would have anyone to host the show with. So I think that's gonna wrap it up for the network tonight, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us here live at twitch.tv slash Final Encountercast. We're gonna throw out a host here in a few minutes. But uh, yeah, we appreciate you joining us live. You can join us for the fun here at twitch.tv slash Final Encountercast every Sunday starting at 5 p.m. And we hope that you do hit that follow button and join us. We We've got a lot of streaming that's been going on. Robbie, you've been streaming a lot of World of Warcraft over here on uh, FEC. And, uh, yeah, just uh, make sure that you hit that follow button and uh, come back. Join us for uh, all of our uh, stupidness and our uh, blowjob jokes. jokes. (laughs) And our miserableness. That's right. There's lots of miserableness. That's right. (laughs) I'm playing WoW now. <laughs> unending, unending miserableness. That should be that should be the new slogan for the show. Un- <laughs> unending miserableness. Unyielding miserableness. Anyway, another victory for America. <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna do it here for Final Encounter Cast. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for uh, for hanging out with us. FinalEncounterCast.com is the website. Make sure you go uh, check that out. Uh, subscribe to us on uh, whatever pl- uh, podcast platform that you use: iTunes, Google Play, whatever it is. Uh, make sure that you're following Final Encounter Cast or the LBS our LBR Podcast Network. I want to thank my crew. Of course, Kooky Persona was hanging out uh, answering phones, as well as Robbie Skyping in today, but also uh, Chris, K-R-Y-S, and Callie. Thanks, guys, for joining us. I'm Nate. Have a good one. Final EncounterCast is a production of FinalEncounterCast.com, Limit Break Radio, and Bender Media Productions. Today's episode is produced by Callie Sloan and Kooky Persona. This show is made possible by the generous Patreon donors of the podcast, Limit Break Radio. Opening music provided by Keyboard Kid. More info and music can be found at KeyboardKid206.Bandcamp.com. Closing music provided by Sobzy. More info can be found at Sobzy.Bandcamp.com. For links to articles mentioned on this show, Check out our live blog over at FinalEncounterCast.com. Final EncounterCast and its hosts are solely responsible for its content.